the meeting of Senate Finance Committee will come to order. Um, just to give members and public an idea, the current plan is to start with Senate File 1426 of Senator Murphy, Omnibus State Government Appropriations Bill. Then we would take up the elections bill after that. We'll lay the first one over and then take up the second one. When that's done, we would incorporate that into Senator Murphy's bill. And when we're done with that, we will take up Senator Mitchell's bill, the veterans bill, which is traveling on its own. Then when we're done with that, we will take up Senator Friends's bill and Senator Hur's bills. Um, and we will be recessing at noon for session and we'll return 30 minutes after session, before session ends. Um, and for members, please hold time on your calendar for Thursday for additional omnibus time. Um, we canceled Friday, but Thursday before session we may be meeting. Um, with that, um, welcome to the committee, Senator Murphy, the Senate file 1426. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, uh, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, I am delighted to be here today. Uh, alongside uh, Mr. Erickson and Ms. James uh, to talk with you today about Senate File 1426. This is the state and local government budget omnibus bill. Uh, when I think about this proposal, uh, I think a lot about the family I grew up in and the work that we did together to make sure that the place that we lived, our house, was in good and working order. Um, and I grew up in a family that um, put more sweat and muscle into that effort than uh, money because money was scarce. So I learned how to do a lot of things that have served me well uh, all of my life. Uh, our state government uh, is important uh, to uh, Minnesotans in so many ways. And the state's coffers have been in many ways depleted uh, over a number of years. Um, and for that reason, our state government has been running on a lean budget um, operating at a fraction of what I believe is needed to serve Minnesotans at its fullest capacity. This budget, uh, when adopted, will not only ensure our government is functional and effective, but able to provide excellent levels of service for Minnesotans all across the state. It'll ensure our government is modern with historic levels of investment in technology, secure in bolster protections against rising digital threats, accountable in its updates to grants management and oversight, and inclusive in its funding of language translation, accessibility upgrades, and new councils, centered in meeting the needs of growing populations across the state. With this budget, Minnesotans can expect a reliable and valuable government that serves the people and works to make their lives better. And with that, I'm happy to go through the bill and its presentation. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Did you want to deal with uh, amendments first, and then before we do the walkthrough? Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, I would love to offer the A40 amendment. And I um, believe the <clears throat> A40 amendment is in the packets. I uh, have it before me. It should be in our packets. Or on top of the packets, okay. <laughs> um, Senator Murphy offers the A40 amendment. Do you want to have you or somebody go through it? Mr. Mr. Eric, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and, um, and Senator Murphy. The A40 makes a few changes uh, to the bill. The parts on lines 1.2 to 1.5 and then from 1.7 to 1.3 take a statutory appropriation to the state auditor for certain um, responsibilities that they're uh, responsible for and moves it into the direct appropriation base there is a change in the avail availability of some funds um, that is changing from 2028 to 2027. That change is on 1.6. Um, I believe the remaining portions are in Ms. James's area. Ms. James, welcome to the committee. M Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, the amendment um, beginning on line 1.14 to 1.26 is a new provision that requires that agencies assume the legal validity of a provision in a bill um, when they prepare a fiscal note. Um, and then lines 1.28 to uh, 2.4 of the amendment sets the effective date of two sections in the bill 
as the day following final enactment. These are sections in the bill that change the effective date of the law that establishes Juneteenth as a holiday. And, and the provisions in the bill set the effective date um, as the day after enactment, but then those sections of the bill also need an effective date that's the day after enactment. So that's what these are. And then beginning on line 2.5 is the section that this committee is familiar with that establishes additional oversight for um, grants and business subsidies. And then um, that takes you to um, page four of the amendment, that the new article five that starts on line 4.4, and Mr. Erickson will describe that. Mr. Chair, article, the new article five changes some provisions related to uh, finance policy. It the section one, beginning of 4.7, defines a transfer in statute. Uh, there is a change to um, a specific day for the November forecast, namely December 6th, rather than the end of the first week of December. And then there is the change of some obsolete uh, or, uh, language that is in the, the forecast statutes. There's also a setting of the budget reserve on line 5.21. And I believe that covers uh, the remaining provisions of the, the amendment. Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Nauman. I know there's uh, many things in Mr. Erickson's head, so I'll just highlight on line 5.3, the language requires a budget close report at the end of a biennium. This would be something that would be assistive to legislative fiscal staff and maybe others. And also on Mr. page Chair. 6 of the amendment. Mr. Nauman, if you could just get a little closer. It's, I can hear you, but I can barely hear, make the words up. I apologize. On line 5.3 of the amendment, is new language that requires MMB to provide a budget close report, basically a fund balance, at the end of the biennium. This is a new uh, requirement, but it would be assistive to legislative fiscal staff and maybe others. Um, then at the end of the amendment, there's a repeal of the old tobacco securitization bonds authority that members may recall that there were two types of bonds that were authorized in 2011, securitization bonds and um, appropriation bonds. This is the former, and repealing of those statutes just cleans up obsolete statutes. Is there Senator Westrom? Mr. Chair, um, to the part of the amendment that talked about uh, agencies uh, Assuming legal validity when they're preparing fiscal notes, uh, Senator Murphy or Stephanie, Ms. James, can you explain that a little bit more? What are we talking about there, and what's what's the issue that's that's aris arisen uh, uh, that we're trying to fix? Mr. Chair and Senator Westrom, uh, I am going to turn to Ms. James, but as I understand this. We have had um, some issues with assumptions about whether or not something might have a legal challenge in the future, um, interfering with the present or with the, uh, the creation of a fiscal note. And with that, I'd like to turn it to Ms. James. Ms. James. Mr. Chair and members, uh, yes, Senator Murphy has, just, has described it correctly. Um, this would just require agencies to prepare the fiscal note, to not, to not refuse to prepare the fiscal note based on their assessment that a bill has a provision that is not legally valid. So they would assume legal validity and then prepare the fiscal note. So Mr. Chair, uh, Ms. James, <clears throat> so, so in, in some cases the legislature might be feeling they're getting stonewalled or the agency decides uh, for whatever reason we don't think this would be le legal or allowed to do so therefore we don't have to do the fiscal note because it wouldn't wouldn't pass the, the legal test. The flip side of that is um, that, and what we're saying is that's not your place to decide. Just tell us if this was to happen. That's what we want to know, the fiscal cost of X, Y, or Z. So that's the first premise. Second, then do we have situations where they're otherwise adding in cost to the fiscal note? Uh, making their own assessment or opinion that something's not legal, so therefore we're going to have legal challenge, so then it increases the fiscal note because 
they think here's the program and here's the cost, we're going to have to defend it. I, two parts, if you can Mr. cover Harris. both those. Uh, Senator, uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Westrom, uh, yes, I think we, we have seen that occasionally. Usually it's in the narrative where an agency will describe that we expect that there will be legal challenges uh, to provisions in the bill. The LBO under its standards and procedures usually gets that um, not booked in the tables as a secondary cost, something that we can't assume will happen, uh, although occasionally we'll see a bill that will appropriate money on the front end for the possibility of legal challenges. Okay. And, and Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Sorry to be uh, so intrigued by such a little nuanced part of the amendment, but it, it is a big, big deal. Um, but uh, how, how does this change with the LBO uh, ultimately being more responsible for our fiscal notes uh, now? Um, is it the agencies we're really targeting here, or is it the LBO, or both? Um, and then I have one more follow-up. Mr. Erickson, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Westrom, I don't think it's, uh, whether it's the LBO or anyone else completing it, I don't think that's uh, terribly relevant. It would just, they're the court, they're coordinating the uh, completion of the fiscal note, and so this just uh, establishes what assumptions are required of the fiscal note. So I think it's, it's really um, a directive at the agencies to complete the, the note, regardless okay. of their feelings about its legal validity. And and then final question, Mr. Chair, Senator Murphy, um, if I'm kind of following this, uh, reading through the lines, um, agencies have a lot of sway and power, and one of the things this does is just says, do your job. You don't get, you don't have to add opinion or pontificate on legal, legal if something's legal or not, which is a way to sway or persuade or subtly uh, uh, kill or pass something uh, legislatively, which reminds me of uh, the saying former Representative Solberg said all the time, uh, or often, uh, you know, fiscal notes have many times been used to kill good legislation or pass things. Uh, if they want them, uh, you can use them either way. And so is that kind of what we're getting at here, Senator Murphy, uh, ultimately, uh, we don't, we don't need all this extra opinion added in to either hurt or harm or, or benefit a fiscal note. Let's just get the facts. Mr. Chair and Senator Westrom, uh, it's funny that you uh, made reference to um, Representative Solberg, former Representative Solberg. The phrase that I've often heard is death by fiscal note, um, which is very colloquial um, and uh, and has, it has a meaning because so many of us have experienced something like that. I think it is important uh, that the LBO and the agencies are giving us their best judgment and rendering fiscal notes that we can rely upon because we use those fiscal notes to build the state budget that has to balance. So we want their very best judgment. But I also believe that the legislature, when moving public policy um, with budgetary impacts, should get fiscal notes for their bills. Um, and what we're saying with this language is that if uh, the person working on the fiscal note is concerned that there could be in the future or uh, has a question about legal validity of something the legis legislature is working on, that cannot be a reason not to do the fiscal note. We need the information um, in this branch of government in order to make the decisions that we need to make as we are moving policy and budget um, through this agenda. One last thing, um, and you made reference to this, Senator Westrom, in your early question, and Mr. Erickson made reference to this as well. When I say that I believe it is important that we are getting the best judgment from the agencies in the LBO, I would want in the narrative their concerns about the proposal. And if there is a question about legal validity, I would want that in the document. Uh, but it, it can't by itself be a reason not to complete the work. And that's what this proposal is for. Thank you, Senator Murphy. On Senator Murphy, on Senator Westrom's point, I wonder if, when I'm hearing it described and so on, if it might, something to look at as the process goes forward, whether instead of saying they must assume the legal validity of the bill, that they must complete the fiscal note, even if they have doubts about the legal validity of the bill, because you're giving them the ability to comment there. Anyway, just food for thought as you continue to move forward on this. So any other discussion of the amendment? 
If not, Senator Murphy moves the A40 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Senator Murphy, did you have one more? The A30 amendment, is that yours as well? No. That's, oops, sorry, different bill. Never mind. All right, Mr. Chair. Um, do you want to begin with the walkthrough of the bill, Mr. Erickson, or is that appropriate? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I think, are you going to explain, because I think one of the summaries is, I think we have two summaries in our packet, and one is newer than the other. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. The, there are two spreadsheets that uh, the, the committee members should have in their packets. The first one that I'll go through is, is a much more detailed version, but I won't be walking through that piece. I do want to orient you just to what's there uh, so everybody's clear. And by the way, these will be um, largely the same sort of documents we'll be, be working through uh, for the elections and the vets bills as well. They're all modeled on the same format. Uh, so the, the much more detailed version that starts with a cover page um, that is timestamped April 3rd, 2023 at 1.53 p.m. Uh, the first page of that is a general fund summary. So this is very, very high level uh, descriptions by agencies, their various direct and open appropriations um, that show the governor's position, the Senate's position, and two columns showing uh, the difference from base for each of those two positions. The first two columns are the 22-23 uh, current biennium. The middle columns are the budget biennium, 20, fiscal 24-25. And then the shaded columns near the end uh, in green are the um, tails columns, 26 and 27. If you go down to the bottom of the second page, you will see the net general fund spending. And in this case, you will see uh, a negative 58.1 million in the uh, current biennium and a 458.1 spend in the budget biennium. Combining those two numbers gives you a net three-year spend of $400 million, which was the committee's target. Uh, if you go over to the farthest, the lower right number, uh, that will be $199.77 million, and that is in keeping with the tails target of $200 million. If you flip to the next page, that begins the much more detailed look at the state government budget. This is what's used to ultimately build the appropriations in the bill. Again, I won't go all the way through this, but this is a very detailed look at each agency budget, all funds. Uh, so you'll find the general fund appropriations that I'll talk about shortly, but you'll also find um, internal some internal service funds. You'll find some special revenue funds uh, and, and such like that that is not on the uh, front page. With that, I'm going to move to the second uh, spreadsheet that's in your packet, which is a change item only packet. Uh, it has much larger writing on it and uh, is much more uh, specific to the things that are actually changing and probably blessedly is much shorter than the, the detailed version. Uh, this only shows change from base, so you're not going to find the totals that are in the bill. You're not going to find uh, how much they are ultimate, each agency is ultimately being appropriated. This is just a description of the change from the base. You'll see a fiscal 23 column for changes in the current biennium, and then the uh, three central columns are the budget biennium, followed by the tails columns, again shaded in green on the far right. So walking through that, we'll begin with the legislature on line five. The Senate has requested and is getting in the bill a $9.8 million operating adjustment. The House, a $15.7 million operating adjustment. The LCC, uh, it's labeled an operating adjustment. I should actually add the word and requests in here. This includes both their, uh, their operations adjustment, adjustment, but also some change items related to increased dues for organizations like NCSL. Um, some new interpreters, some IT upgrades that, that are both upgrades but also replacing equipment that's at the end of life, uh, some money for the revisor to, uh, to upgrade the drafting system, uh, a diversity and inclusion officer, um, and some additional money for the pensions commission to uh, have increased access to the actuary that is hired by the LCPR. There is on line eight, oh, excuse me, line nine, um, $400,000 for the Office on the Economic Status of Women. There is $500,000 in the bill for uh, provisions related to collective bargaining that was Senate File 83 McEwen for legislative employees, and $232,000 one time for the Legislative Task Force on Aging, which was Senator Morrison's Senate File 1022. 
The governor has two change items. The second one first is the um, is some funding for a design study to stand up a new office of, of uh, tribal state relations. That is $290,000 one time. The other three numbers are all working in tandem with some other numbers we'll see later in the spreadsheet. Currently, the governor funds several FTEs by having agencies transfer money for certain centralized services to the governor's office. This is changing that to a direct funding model. So you'll see that there is uh, $10.9 million in direct funding from the general fund for the governor to uh, fund those FTEs. There is a corresponding decrease on line 18 uh, from the special revenue fund. So this will be paired with other change items later that are showing a decrease in the uh, revenue that uh, or the transfers into the special revenue that balances this decreased expenditure in that fund. Beginning on line 20 is the state auditor. The first five items uh, are related to new FTEs that the, the well, not all of the, the first one is an operating adjustment. The next ones are new FTEs that the state auditor is looking to add for administrative support, technology staffing, and a, a township specialist, and legal and special investigation staffing. Um, respectively, those items are 1.5 million, 800,000, 500,000, 229,000, and 730,000. Uh, there's also some one-time money for uh, electro, uh, excuse me, for city and town accounting system upgrades and reporting another compliance dashboard. These are one-time IT projects totaling $1.1 million, and you'll see those split out on lines 27 and 28. The Attorney General has an operating adjustment that in, uh, includes the hiring of several new FTEs and uh, also has some technology upgrades baked into that number. That number is $25.4 million. Uh, and then the, there's a one-time operating adjustment capturing some one-time uh, space needs and, and one-time technology upgrades amounting to $10 million. On page two, the Secretary of State items that do not relate to elections are in the state government area, and so here we see a $764,000 operating adjustment, uh, $760,000 for Safe at Home program um, uh, maintenance, $236,000 to expand the business services division, provide translation services and materials, $400,000 to enhance office physical security, which includes uh, a security guard both for the elections division and also for the business services division, $176,000 for diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion coordinator, and then again, two IT uh, data items, or excuse me, the first one's an IT upgrade, the content management system upgrade. The second is related to moving uh, several of the data servers that are in a building that, um, that they're being asked to vacate. Starting on fi uh, line 51 is the Capital Area Architectural and Planning Board with $165,000 to maintain current ser service levels. There's a $185,000 appropriation one time uh, for some rulemaking to comply with the newly adopted comprehensive plan. There is $500,000 in uh, money for the commemorative works for the capital grounds change item uh, that has some extended availability, and then $1 million one time to update the capital mall design framework plan. Um, this is to implement parts of the comp plan on the capital mall. This will be paired with a, another change item at the Department of Administration. The Office of Administrative Hearings has a $61,000 uh, change item to maintain current service levels. There is a uh, deficiency funding that is blank here because that is now appearing under other bills. We'll get to that lower uh, in the spreadsheet. And two, uh, $2.1 million one time for a new web-based uh, public comment portal. You'll also see below the, the line there that there are three change items that are being funded out of the Workers' Compensation Fund, uh, including some more maintaining current service levels there, some improvement of court services and court security costs. Uh, moving to the to Minnesota IT services, there is a $1.4 million to main, uh, change item to maintain current service levels, and then several one-time change items relating to uh, various IT upgrades. The, the first on line 71 is some cybersecurity advancements amounting to $32.9 million, which includes uh, some cybersecurity funding, but also includes the match for federal grants related to a cybersecurity program enacted at the federal level. There's 33.4 or 33.6 million dollars, excuse me, for enterprise cloud transformation, 40 million dollars one time for targeted application modernization, and 4 million one time for children's cabinet IT changes. Uh, that last item has some extended availability into the tails, despite being one time. 
Uh, there is $600,000 to improve accessible technology at Minute Services. This is a current office, but adds an FTE in the general fund, the current basis funded out of the TAM fund. There is $734,000 to expand GIS services provided by the MinGeo office. $2.5 million that decreases in the tails to $900,000 for executive branch digital media services and $22 million for the Public Land Survey Monument Grant Program uh, that came before the committee as Senate File 1659, Senator Carlson's bill. There's also uh, some cash flow assistance to offer that I'll, I'll describe when we get to the bill. Uh, moving to the Department of Administration on line 83, there's a 3.3 million change to maintain current service levels, a $700,000 for the PTAC, uh, the Procurement Technical Assistance Center to provide a state match for federal funds, $20 million for space consolidation, relocation, and rent loss. This has to do with agencies moving and reducing their footprint in recent years. Uh, so this covers the cost of actually moving those agencies around and then covering the, the cost of the space uh, that has been vacated for which admin will still be responsible even if there's no tenant. There is also $1.2 million in the bill for the in lieu of rent operating um, uh, operations. Uh, this is an adjustment to the base there. Um, and and provide support, again, for spaces that are statutorily free and for which nobody is paying rent. There is $478,000 in the bill for the archaeological and cemetery site inventory portal, as well as a $400,000 increase to the Office of the State Archaeologist. There is $12.5 million in the bill for uh, risk management fund property self-insurance, which, which will increase the state's ability to self-insure, uh, which is being demanded by uh, some of the state's reinsurers as uh, the risk is uh, increasing. There is an addition of three FTEs for the small agency resource team, the SMART team, amounting to $650,000. Uh, $985,000 for SHPO to um, upgrade some electronic project systems and databases, 900, uh, excuse me, uh, $1.9 million for an increase in the Office of Enterprise Sustainability. Uh, the bill also creates this office in statute rather than by executive order. The Office of Grants Management is getting an increase of three FTEs amounting to $2 million along with some other costs related to that and another three FTEs for uh, equity initiatives in the Office of Grants Management amounting to $894,000. Uh, the $936,000 on line 97 is for a feasibility study for the statewide, statewide grants management system, uh, this, which involves hiring a consultant and some staff costs at the Department of Administration. The, there is uh, $2.5 million in the bill for the Office of Enterprise Translations to centralize translation services and reduce reliance on contracts that state agencies uh, pursue on their own currently. Uh, $1 million in the bill for an economic disparity study in, in state procurement that used to be required every five years, uh, and this brings that back, um, and this would be done through a vendor. There is $102,000 for IT project and program management within the department, uh, $1 million for a small agency study, there is, uh, excuse me, $102,000, the $1 million here is for public TV block grants. This is a one-time appropriation. Uh, there is $1.3 million in the bill for a, uh, a grant to Ampers to launch a statewide diverse community news service. Ampers is also seeing uh, $3 million in one-time increases for community servicing equipment grants. I will cover that in a moment when we get to the riders in the bill. There is $2.2 million in the bill for parking fund support as the parking fund uh, with decreased parking in, in recent years has seen pressure on that internal service fund. So the fund is being supplemented with a general fund transfer. There is money in the bill, 520,000 for two FTEs for the state demographer, $5 million for the other half of that updating the Capital Mall design framework plan uh, that we saw in the cap board where there was $1 million. There is $889,000 in the bill for Senator Murphy's Senate File 2156, the Buy Clean and Buy Fair Minnesota Act, uh, and then $186,000 and then $79,000 for um, some upgrades that admin is, needs to make to training modules and support and development for two new councils that are being created in the bill, uh, Senator May Quaid's Council on LGBTQIA Minnesotans and Senator Swadzinski's Youth Advisory Council. Uh, there's also a uh, change item here for archaeological and cemetery site inventory portal. This is in the special revenue fund and is offset by fees that are charged for the use of that portal. 
Moving to MMB on line 114, there is $5.5 million in the bill to maintain current service levels, $28 million in the bill for the enterprise resource planning systems funding. There is extended availability of this appropriation. There is also a removal of the uh, billing cap that is currently imposed on their ability to charge agencies for um, this, these services. There is increased staffing for financial oversight. That's uh, $4.4 million, some uh, uh, $2 million for enterprise continuity planning to improve response to emergencies and workplace violence. Five FTEs for a new statewide internal audit office. That is $1.1 million. On line 120 is the establishing an enterprise strategy and performance team to consolidate some enterprise planning that is currently uh, scattered across many state agencies, and that amount is $4.7 million. There is ongoing dedicated funding for the Children's Cabinet, $2 million in the current biennium. Uh, two FTEs to help with capital budget outreach and assistance of $634,000. One-time funding for a study and recommendations on equity and agency data practices on line 123, that is $5 million one time, and $162,000 in the bill for Senator May Quaid, Senate File 1261 on the employment and retention of employees with disabilities. There are up other, also a couple of change items here for MMB that are, in, that are non-operational for MMB. Uh, there's an in increase in the contingent account appropriations of $1 million in the first year and $1.5 million in the second year. In both cases, this brings the uh, total funding to um, $2 million, or excuse me, $1.5 one million. Uh, that is a one-time change in the contingent account uh, appropriation. You'll see also here the other half of the governor's office operating increase, the change to the direct funding model. Uh, we're asking the, uh, excuse me, the, the bill is having uh, the uh, commissioner of management and budget reduce agency budgets by the amount that uh, transfers are currently made into the special revenue account so that uh, those agencies aren't just absorbing uh, the fact that those transfers are no longer being made and keeping uh, the money. On line 131, there is a one-time cancellation of money that is left in the, uh, that had been appropriated from the general fund for COVID-19 response. Uh, that money expired on March 30th, but under the budget rules, we can cancel that money and take credit for the, the change. That is a $58.3 million cancellation. The Department of Revenue has a uh, maintain current service levels change item amounting to $41.6 million. And at this point, there will be quite a few of those where we're seeing just maintaining current service levels or an increased staff member, so I'll move pretty quickly. The Gambling Control Board has a maintained current service levels of 2.7 that comes out, uh, 2.7 million that comes out of their special revenue account. The Racing Commission, a $61,000 that comes out of a uh, uh, special revenue account at the Racing Commission, as well as a $1 million one-time appropriation to uh, implement the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Act uh, passed at the federal level. The Amateur Sports Commission has 36,000 as a maintain current service levels and 100,000 for a new fiscal coordinator. The Minnesotans of African Heritage Council, 90,000 to maintain current service levels and 417,000 for additional staffing. The Latino Affairs Council, 46,000 for maintaining current service levels and $210,000 for increased staffing. The Council on Asian Pacific Minnesotans, a $200,000 change for maintaining current service levels the Indian Affairs Council, 129,000 to maintain current service levels and 240,000 for a new position, and 600,000 as well to implement the Private Cemeteries Act update that is in the policy articles in the bill. There's $999,000 for the new Council on LGBTQIA Minnesotans that was Senator May Quaid's bill I referenced earlier. Likewise, one, point, uh, or $1 million for the Youth Advisory Council, a new council created in Senator Swazinski Senate File 194. The Minnesota Historical Society has several change items, 4.1 million to maintain current service levels, 750,000 is a one-time uh, offset for COVID or, uh, revenue losses ex experienced during COVID. This is a one-time $750,000 appropriation. $35,000 one time is to staff the State Emblems Redesign Commission established by Senate File 386, Senator Kunesh's bill. There's a one-time increase to the Farm America 
uh, grant that flows through the Minnesota Historical Society as fiscal agent. Uh, this is $200,000 total and was in Senator Dames' Senate file 2906. Mm -hmm. And there's also a $19.2 million appropriation for historic sites asset preservation. Uh, those are capital improvements and site betterment at Minnesota Historical Society properties. At the Minnesota Arts Board, there's $39,000 to maintain current service levels and $400,000 for two new FTEs for improved grants oversight. The Minnesota Humanities Center has $190,000 to maintain current service levels and $700,000 for a one-time increase in the Healthy Eating Here at Home or Market Bucks program. Uh, there's some extended availability on those grants, uh, but they are one-time in addition to the base that is ongoing. The Accountancy Board has a $61,000 change to maintaining current service levels and $240,000 for additional staffing. The Architectural and Engineering Board, $58,000 to maintain current service levels, $188,000 for the Barber's Examiner's Board to maintain current service levels, $1.1 million for the Cosmetology Examiner Board to maintain current service levels, and $91,000 related to some programming changes um, to coordinate changes required for the new hair technician licensing provisions in the bill. There's also $50,000 one time to the Bureau of Mediation Services to coordinate unit certification related to the changes for legislative employee collective, collective bargaining in Senator McHugh and Senate File 83. Uh, we get down here into some of the, the summary provisions, uh, general fund, the total changes in uh, direct appropriations from the general fund. Uh, amounting to $457.1 million in the budget biennium, but offset by the 58.3 in savings from the previous biennium. There are no changes to any open appropriations, as you'll see on line 249, and then some non-general fund changes. You'll see on line 255, changes to revenues and transfers that are in the bill. There is 866,000 in expected uh, billing revenue to be raised by the increased FTEs at the state auditor. The state auditor is required to recover costs uh, through billing, and so some of the new FTEs that come in will, of course, bill back out, and this is the offset there. There's also an ongoing loss of about $2 million to the general fund uh, from a parking fund debt service that, uh, that's being uh, repealed in the bill um, related to uh, uh, a transfer that goes into the general fund from the parking fund relating to the Senate parking garage. On line 265, there's a $39,000, begins a $39,000 revenue related to hair technician licensing. Uh, this would be the new fees for that new license type. On line 270, this is the non-general fund uh, parts, including the general fund, or the, uh, the governor's change item related to direct billing. 103,000 uh, that offsets the, the archeological and cemetery site inventory portal expenditures we saw earlier under uh, admin. This is the, the revenue that flows into that special revenue account. And then the final two moving pieces are on lines 282 and 283 where we see, uh, or excuse me, on 282 there is one that we see that is other bills. This is Senator Murphy's OAH deficiency bill uh, that was signed uh, last week, chapter 23, one time funding for the uh, Office of Administrative Hearings deficiency, $196,000. Uh, another one, another other bill that is not shown uh, but is included here was Senate File 33, signed into law as Chapter 8. This was the uh, ongoing funding for the Attorney General's office uh, that was passed in February and provided $269,000 in fiscal 23 and $2 million ongoing. That is now baked into the November forecast and therefore shows up in the base rather than as a change item in the bill. And Mr. Chair, that takes us through the spreadsheet. I will very quickly just go through some of the riders in the bill so that you can see some of the extended availability. Um, if you be, be looking at the bill beginning on page five, you'll see paragraphs A and B. These combine into the cybersecurity advancements change item that I referred to. Paragraph A is that federal match, whereas paragraph B is the, um, the separate cybersecurity enhancements that the agency is looking to do. You'll see extended availabilities of one-time appropriation on lines 5.32 to 5.33, 6.7 .7 to 6.9, 6.16 to 6.18, uh, and I think that is it in those two areas, oh no, and 7.9 to 7.11. Uh, I will note 
that paragraph I on page seven, beginning on line 7.3, this is the Public Land Survey System grant program. Uh, you'll note that the amounts for the grant program itself are 16 million the first year and four million the second that are one time. There is also uh, the ability for uh, Minnesota IT services to hold up to 4% of the appropriation uh, by the Chief Geospatial Information Officer for admi administrative costs. There's also uh, a local grant component on line 7.12 to 7.15 of 1 million each year. So that um, that's all rolled into a single item on the, the spreadsheet that's broken out here. The next items I would call attention to are on page 11, where the riders for the uh, public broadcasting grants are just to walk through these pieces because it can get confused, especially looking at the, if you're not looking at the detailed spreadsheet. Paragraph uh, A is a base amount. Paragraph B is a base amount. Paragraph C is the Senator Swadzinski change item for a new change to um, an existing block grant program that has not had funding in some time. Paragraph, uh, excuse me, par now paragraph A, they'll renumber under public radio uh, on line 11.27. The base is 492,000 in each year, so the first year there is an increase of 800,000 in one-time new funding from Senator Kunesh's bill. Paragraph B on page 12 is base funding. Paragraph C is new one-time money for specifically for emergency equipment and increased cybersecurity and broadcast technology. Paragraph D is new one-time money that is called out separately on the spreadsheet. And paragraph E is all base funding for the Amber Alert systems. On page 14, there is some extended availability on line 14.7 of an appropriation. Uh, there's also, in case, uh, uh, it's just sort of an odd one, so I want to call attention to it as well. On page 15, um, paragraph G is language relating to Senator May Quaid's disability, employment and retention of employees with disabilities bill. On line 17, the state lottery doesn't appear in the change item spreadsheet because it's not funded through a direct appropriation, but rather through a cap on operating expenses that it's allowed to retain from its own revenues. The, uh, the amounts in the bill are $40 million in each year, which is increased from $36.5 million previously. On page 18, uh, lines 12 to 19 is the language enabling the asset preservation money at the Minnesota Historical Society. There is more extended availability of a grant, in this case, the Healthy Eating Here at Home grant on page 19, lines 24 to 26. Beginning on page 21, uh, there's no changes here, but i just like to point it out because it's not something people often see on the spreadsheet, is the statutory state aids for the various uh, pension funds. Section 37 on page 22 is the one-time appropriation to the Bureau of Mediation Services. Section 38 effects the cancellation of the COVID-19 management funny funding. And section 39 on page 23 and is the enabling language for that uh, governor's mo uh, changing the funding model to direct billing from um, the special revenue fund to make sure that, it's, that that component is, is cost neutral. I will also just quickly flag a couple of policy pieces that are specifically related to finance before I turn this over to Ms. James. On page 67, in the repealer is the repeal of the required transfer in law from the parking fund into the general fund. Mm -hmm. That is on line 67.24 to 67.25. And then in article three, section six through nine, so go to page 72 to 74, are a couple of components uh, in the Minnesota IT services statutes relating to cash flow, this, it, the new paragraph B on page 73.6. This is language that we've frequently seen in rider language in the past. This part uh, just puts it into statute. Line, or, uh, excuse me, section seven and section eight are changes to the uh, information telecommunications account, also known as the Odyssey Fund, that increases uh, the purposes for which agencies can move money into that account. That would likely change amounts that uh, are expected to cancel at the end of a biennium, but we're unable to price that uh, just based on not the, un the uncertainty of, of how much agencies might uh, choose to avail themselves of this option. And then finally, on page 74, section 9, is the enabling language for the county and local cybersecurity grants um, that I spoke about in the riders and in the spreadsheet. And with that, Matt, uh, Mr. Chair, that is all I have for my part of the walkthrough, and I'm sure Ms. James has something to add. Mm -hmm. 
Um, before we go to that, I wondered if we could have a little more explanation about the bottom of page 73. Certainly, Mr. Chair. Uh, what would you like explained? What exactly is this going to accomplish? I, I, I just like a little more background on it. Yeah, absolutely, Mr. Chair. So the, the Odyssey Fund or the Information Telecommunications account is an account that agencies can use at the end of the biennium with um, after con consultation with the Legislative Advisory Commission to take funds that are left over at the end of the biennium before they cancel and deposit them for an extended availability in this account for specific IT projects that have been worked out with uh, Minnesota IT services and for specifically identified projects. This would expand what projects would be available under that statute. Uh, so you can see on line 73.17, we're adding secure state systems or to address project or product backlogs. Uh, on 73.29, again, we're seeing product or services. So there would be increased uh, options to avail themselves of using this account. It would likely mean that there would be less money that would ca cancel to the general fund at the end of the year, but it's uh, of a level of uncertainty that it, it isn't captured, capturable in a fiscal note. Okay. Is that, is, does that help? Chair? Uh, Senator Jaham, yes. Do, do we have any idea how much gets canceled every year and back into the general fund? Mr. Chair and um, Senator Draham, I'm struggling a little bit. My my recollection is it was about 30 to 35 million two years ago, or in the last biennium. Members will will chairs will remember if you were a chair two years ago, you recall that that's a process that ramps up very quickly after the conclusion of the budget setting session. So we will be going into this where we reviewing requests that agencies would like to take balances that are unspent from the previous biennium and use those balances for, under current law, projects. So this language will expand that authority to product or services. How, how that affects agency behavior, I, none of us can say at this point. Chair? Senator Jayhan. So it would be safe to say that it's well under 100 million across all the agencies and historically for a, a biennium. Mr. Chair and Senator Graham, with the proviso that I am doing my best to remember from the amount two years ago, but I think that's right. Um, it has been growing. Um, this is relatively new authority in the last six to eight years. So as agencies learn about this, it does tend to put some upward pressure on it. Further, just Ms. James, you ready to continue? Mr. Chair and members. Sorry, um, Sorry I believe Senator Western made a question. Mr. Chair, to that question, um, Mr. Nauman, how was it handled before uh, six, eight years ago? And am I correct that it, it used to be more fall to the bottom line, the legislature would repurpose those dollars. If we got into a deficit, a lot of times those were the first couch cushions we'd look under to help uh, balance the budget. Or how, how has that changed? Then I have a follow-up. Mr. Chair and Senator Westrom, I think this is sort of a but-for argument. How does behavior change as a result of a law change? I, I think what I would suggest is that, um, that you may have had circumstances. So your premise is that, that there would be larger cancellations. Larger than what, I would ask you to sort of think about. And then would suggest that maybe the incentive before was for agencies to spend off money that maybe they would not otherwise have been planful about. I don't mean to ascribe value to it, but it is sort of a, a rhetorical question for to think about. But, but would Mr. agencies have maybe spent that money in other ways that they would have preferred to, to do in this particular way so that they can buy some projects that are, are necessary for their enterprise? And, and Mr. Nauman, thank you. But that that is what how it was prior to this. The, 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 the fall to the bottom line, use it or lose it type of scenario before we had moved, moved to this language, correct? With a few exceptions, yes. Okay. Um, all right, thank you. Thank you. Ms. James, go ahead, please. 
Mr. Chair and members, I'll begin with uh, Article 2 um, that starts on page 23. And I will give you a very high-level description of the language in the bill uh, that relates to, uh, that has some fiscal uh, component, most of which um, Mr. Erickson has already described. Sections one through five, beginning on page 23, adopt a new official state seal and flag that will be designed by a commission that's established in an uncoded section in this article. Uh, section six, begins on page 24. Um, this is the first of a series of sections that allows for an election of an exclusive representative by, <coughs> excuse me, by legislative employees. Section eight on page 25 is the first of a, a batch of sections sprinkled throughout that moves um, the function of strategic and long-range planning um, from the Department of Administration to, the, to uh, management and budget. Section 9 on page 25 establishes the Minnesota Youth Advisory Council. Section 10 on page 29 establishes a council on LGBTQIA Minnesotans. Section 11 on page 32 specifies requirements for an updated capital campus design framework. Um, section 12 on page 33 authorizes the Commissioner of Management and Budget to apply for and receive grants. This section also includes a statutory appropriation of any grant funds received to the Commissioner of Management and Budget. Section 14 on page 34 requires approval of the Commissioner of Management and Budget for the rate one agency charges another for services that are paid from the statewide systems account. Section 15 on page 34 eliminates the annual limit on the amount that the Commissioner of Administration may bill for statewide system services. It also adds authority for the Department of Administration to charge the legislature for services. Section 16, beginning on page 34, establishes requirements for materials and products that are used in the construction of state buildings. Um, this provides for the commissioner to set a, a maximum acceptable global warming potential for certain materials in um, state building um, construction projects. Um, it also provides for a pilot program between administration and transportation to obtain estimates from vendors about the greenhouse gas emissions um, over the life cycle of selected products. Um, it also provides uh, um, for the establishment of a task force that will be called the Environmental Standards Procurement Task Force that will look into issues around um, construction materials and greenhouse gas emission reduction. Section 17 creates, on, this is on page 40, creates an Office of Enterprise Sustainability to assist state agencies in making progress on sustainability of government operations. Section 18, beginning on page 41, establishes the Office of Enterprise Translations that will provide translation services for written materials for executive branch agencies. Section 19 on page 41 lowers the threshold for the amount of a one-time expense for the cost of reasonable accommodations that agencies um, can be reimbursed for from the accommodation account. Sections 20 through 28 establish additional grant oversight authority for the Department of Administration. Um, included in these sections is a requirement that grant agreements have to be approved by the Commissioner of Administration. Also, agencies have to publicly report on grantee performance. The Department of Administration um, can, the Commissioner of Administration can suspend or debar a grantee and may terminate a grant unilaterally um, uh, if the Commissioner determines that further performance would not serve agency purposes or is not in the best interests of the state. Sections 31 through 39, um, on, beginning on page 48, institute hair technician licenses, and um, section 39 in that group simplifies salon licenses. <clears throat> 
Section 42, beginning on page 55, is a section that makes changes to the program for treatment of um, the discovery of human remains, and it establishes um, authority for the Indian Affairs Council to um, take certain actions for hum uh, human remains that are those of American Indians. Um, Section 44 that begins on page 61 establishes a grant program for counties to perpetuate the public land survey monument system. Section 45 beginning on page 62 and also section 46 update the effective date for the Juneteenth holiday. Section 47 on page 62 creates a commission to develop and adopt a new design for the official state flag and official seal. Section 48 on page 64 creates a legislative task force on aging. Section, um, section 49 and 50 um, set up the initial appointments for the Youth Advisory Council and the LGBTQIA Minnesotans Council. Section 51 beginning on page 66 requires the Commissioner of Administration to assess the viability of implementing a single grants management system for executive branch agencies. Section 52 establishes uh, or, or provides for a study on whether the current um, support model is adequate for small agencies. Section 53 on page 67 implements the salaries for constitutional officers that were recommended by the Compensation Council. Um, Mr. Erickson already described the repealer in paragraph D um, relating to the parking. Um, fund and the transfers to the general fund um, for, for, um, for that. And then in Article 3, I think Mr. Erickson has already described the provisions with fiscal impact there. Article 4 that begins on page 74 is uh, um, the, all of Article 4 implements the recommendations of the advisory task force on state employment and retention of employees with disabilities. Um, these sections require certain accessibility measures um, be taken for applicants and employees that have disabilities. It also requires training for employees and managers on the obligations related to accessibility and for hiring and uh, retaining employees with disabilities. And, and that is the, the language in the bill. Thank you, Ms. James. There are questions from the committee. Senator Dames. Uh, Mr. Chair, are you open for, um, for general questions at this point? Or? Sure, go ahead. Uh, could you tell me, uh, Senator Murphy, how many uh, new committees or boards or offices or whatever, how many new organizations like that or new offices, uh, whatever, are we creating in this bill? Uh, thank you, Senator Dames. Uh, I used uh, at the start of this the metaphor, if you will, of fixing up the house. Uh, and we are absolutely expanding the table uh, for the voices of Minnesotans who aren't always seen or participating. Uh, there are two new councils, uh, one for youth, for young people. Um, it is uh, moving that model from advisory into a council like we see with other councils. There's another council uh, uh, that is uh, bringing uh, the voices of the LGBTQI uh, community uh, in alignment with the other councils that we have in place right now. And I am looking over my shoulder here at Ms. James, who is pointing at a computer screen. Yeah, I'm going to ask Ms. James to just share what she's sharing with me because she's got the information clearly there. Ms. James, go ahead. Mr. Chair and members, the bill establishes, um, besides the Youth Advisory Council and the Council on LGBTQIA Minnesotans, it also establishes an Office of Environmental Sustainability, Government Operations, and an Office of Enterprise Translations um, it also establishes a few temporary task forces and commissions that are tasked with a particular um, a particular job, um, and then would 
and then would cease after completing their job. That there's the commission to redesign the flag and the seal, a legislative task force on aging, an environmental standards procurement task force, and an advisory committee dealing with service, service worker class specifications. Uh, thank you, Senator Murphy. Can you tell me, Senator Murphy, how many new jobs this uh, uh, creates? Or how many new positions? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Dames. Uh, there is uh, absolutely funding in this proposal uh, for new FTEs. Um, and I don't know the number, um, but I will get it for you. And when you're doing that, could you also give me, get me the cost? Yes, Senator Dames, I will do that for you. I'll Thank do my you. best to get that for you before we come to the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Dreheim. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Senator Murphy, for, for bringing a, a, the bill forward. Um, I had a few questions, but I also have an amendment. I'd like to get that out of the way if I could, Mr. Chair. Uh, the A37, I believe, is the number. Senator Jayheim offers the A37 amendment. It will be distributed. Chair, if I could. Go ahead. Um, I think everybody's getting it distributed. Go yeah, ahead now. Just to describe, it's pretty short, uh, members, and, and to save Senator Murphy some time, it, it removes the language and funding for the legislative staff unionization. And I, um, I have a real problem with this, trying to balance um, a union that has very strong ties to one side uh, of the political spectrum to a bunch of employees that are partisan <coughs> and nonpartisan, probably nonpartisan more, more than anything. And I think our nonpartisan staff, uh, the seven years I've been here, work very hard to be neutral. And, and I think this could affect that. Um, so I, I I, you know, to spend a half million dollars to set this up and and with that union having a political action um, component uh, that writes checks, I, I just don't think it would be appropriate. I would much rather see us spend that half million dollars and give it to our legislative staff uh, who, who work long hours, as we know. Um, so that, that's my E37 members. I hope you will consider it. Um, I, I, just don't think it's it's appropriate. Um, so that's it. Senator Murphy on the A37. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Dreheim, very much. Uh, I I carefully considered this uh, proposal, and what is in this bill is much different than the bill that was introduced by Senator McEwen. Um, what is in this bill? eliminates a prohibition on legislative employees and their ability to form a, a union. So there are many questions embedded in that. Um, if, we, if we begin a conversation about what it would mean for the employees of the legislature to organize and form a union, um, uh, you enter into questions right away about what it means for partisan and nonpartisan staff alike. Um, those questions are unanswered and would be in the domain of the employees if they chose to pursue unionization. Um, and in order to open this conversation up uh, and, and to, to allow the employees that work for the legislature to pursue this means taking away the prohibition. But we would be then counting on uh, the people who work here, um, and I know we all have deep respect for the people who work here, to wrestle with what it would mean to organize and how that would work for them before they could ever bring that question forward to a vote. So all we're doing in the bill is saying to the people who work here, if you choose to pursue this, you can. There's money in the bill uh, in the event that they would do that. Um, that's, that's why that, that is there. Uh, I did some consulting with Secretary Bowden. Uh, and, uh, of course, for the Bureau of Mediation Services who could engage, uh, who could be asked to engage 
if the, the workers who, uh, the people who work in the legislature pursued this. Uh, so given that, and given the careful con uh, consideration, and I, he I hear what you are saying, Senator Dreheim, um, my faith in the people who work here overrides that concern, and so I would ask members of the committee to not support Senator Dreheim's uh, amendment so that we can give the people who work in the legislature the opportunity to engage in this discussion. Thank you very much, with due respect. Senator Dreheim. Thank you, uh, Senator Mur Murphy, on that. Um, you know, I, I just, we have great staff, um, especially the nonpartisan staff that, that walk that fine line, balancing out the two crazies on either side of the aisle. Um, and I, I just think this is a very slippery slope and, and uh, um, you know, I, I just think it's the, the wrong direction to go. Um, you know, the staff right now, we know, we trust them, but staff retires and, and, and new people come in. Um, so I just renew my, my motion for the A37 and urge a, a yes vote. Further discussion on the A37 and mo motion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Chairs in doubt. Division and with those online please turn on their cameras. All those in favor, raise your hands. All those opposed. The motion does not prevail. The next further discussion or amendments. Further discussion? Mr. Chair? Go ahead, Senator. I'm sorry, Senator Murphy, did you want to go? Okay, sorry. Senator Draham, go ahead. Thank you. I, I just wanted to uh, um, just talk a little bit about the flag design a little bit. And, and it's my understanding that this bill, um, as drafted, will have a task force decide is there a provision in there where it'll come back for us for final approval or choice between two options? Can you just get a little more in depth on that? Mr. Chair and Senator Dreheim, uh, this is an issue, of course, that has uh, permeated uh, discussions across Minnesota for, for many years. This is a Senator Kunish bill. Um, and as it is in this proposal, there would be a working group, a task force that comes together uh, that considers this question. It is a large task force that is inclusive of people from across the state with various perspectives. They would be tasked with uh, choosing a design. Uh, they would make a report back to the legislature, but the decision that they make would be the final decision. It would not, at this point, come back to the legislature for final approval. The reason why I uh, considered, and this was a, a, a significant debate in the committee, um, this is something Senator Draskowski has been uh, very focused on. Uh, the reason why I left the bill intact as Senator Kunish has proposed it is because this is, as we have seen in the committee, a, a, a hot button issue for sure. And I have concern that a working group that takes on this issue um, and makes a recommendation to this body, um, that that recommendation would get lost in the, in the hotness of this discussion. Um, and so I, I left the bill intact. Senator Kunish has, um, as, as the author of the bill and as she has recommended, knowing um, that the legislature often wants to have a final say in things, in all sorts of things, and uh, the legislature may decide uh, we want a final say. But I thought it was worth the discussion of uh, when we bring a group of people together, a group of Minnesotans together to wrestle with something. Uh, that uh, I believe uh, and have faith that they are able to do that um, and render a conclusion. And sometimes it is better to leave the discussion and the decision there rather than bring it back through this body, which I'm a part of, I believe in, um, despite all of our um, 
and partisan differences. I know that the people who are a part of this body are here because they believe deeply in what we need to do together for the people of Minnesota. Um, uh, I think that we would wrestle with this. But I will ask say that the legislator, the, the work of the body um, is done uh, in 2024. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just reading a note. So the task force finishes uh, in January of 24. Senator Murphy, and the new could you flag. Tell me, excuse me for just a second, interrupting on yeah. that, but could you tell me what page the language is on? For, do you know, Ms. James? It is on page 23. So there would be time if this task force acts and draws a conclusion, and they may draw the conclusion that the flag that we have is the flag that we keep, there would be time for the legislature to act. Um, so we're not divorced of this, um, but I think it is important to recognize that we're asking a group of people to come together to make, uh, to make uh, this question their question to answer. And I left the bill intact for that reason. Chair. Senator Drehan. I don't want to dwell on this. I, 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 so my advice would be to have them come back with a couple options and one of them for me would be to leave it alone and maybe two other options. That's how I would have done it and had to come back to us for us to pick. And then do you have an estimate on the fiscal impact of changing the flag? Mr. Erickson. So, uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Dreheim, the, the impact is $35,000 for the historical side to staff the commission that's in there. Those are the direct costs of, of that. Everything else will end up being a secondary cost if a flag were adopted and if things need to be replaced, that would be not captured in, in any sort of fiscal note. So, Mr. Chair, Go ahead. Good, thank you. I, I, I guess that's part of my decision making. How much are we going to spend redoing the flag? Um, you know, our, all our stationary and, you know, have that emblem on it, or at least for me and my business cards. Um, and then, of course, the cost of flags throughout every um, government building pretty much in the state. Um, so, you know, if we're going to fund this, even though it's not a, a huge dollar amount, to me, that's part of the piece of the puzzle, and, and I think we need to know that before we vote on on this portion. So, it, uh, has anybody addressed that or guessed at what it would cost us, Senator Murphy? Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Draham, no, we have not uh, gone down the path of, of trying to cost out what it would, what an eventual cost would be if we decided to change the flag. And let me just say, like I know that if you have been involved in politics in Minnesota for long. Uh, you've probably heard uh, the debate among a variety of people about the flag and what it represents, um, the importance of it, the pain of it. Uh, for some, the mischaracterization or misrepresentation. There are a lot of feelings attached to this issue. Um, and I am do doing in this bill and in this legislature the work to try and navigate that conversation um, to open up the question. And I take your point uh, with good intention uh, and will uh, consider that as we move this bill going forward. But I, th I think it is, it is important for Minnesota that we, um, that we take this up um, and that we may conclude, as you suggested, uh, that the flag that we have is the flag that we choose. Um, but I don't know the outcome to that question. So if I could, Sorry. one more follow up on this. Go ahead. Uh, so are you going to have the task force look at the cost of what it would cost to do the the, the new version of the flag? I, I mean, I think that has to be part of our, our decision making up here. Um, so if it's $5 million um, or $50 million. So I, I think that's something that needs to be included. But that, that's it on that. Thank you, Chair and Senator Murphy. Senator Friends. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Murphy, for bringing the whole bill forward. I, too, have some questions about the flag, and I guess I would put it this way. To be blunt, I would not be comfortable supporting it without some chance for the people of Minnesota to weigh in uh, more completely than just the task force. I think what we want here is a durable solution that all Minnesota can get behind, and I think we're unlikely to get that if we name a task force who is empowered not only with the ability to come up with the design, but then to actually enact it by... Uh, January 1st, I think, to be commissioned by May 11th, 2024. So I would encourage us as we go forward to consider how can we provide Minnesotans with the buy-in to make a more durable agreement or decision to stay with the existing flag if that's to be the fate, although I don't think so. Um, I think that will be a far better solution and far easier for a lot of us to support. 
I can only imagine if we announce to the people of Minnesota that the task force has the power to not only adopt the flag, but then uh, that's the final word on it. Uh, we're going to start getting some calls from Minnesotans who have not been following it that closely, who would like to talk to us about who gets appointed to that task force. And for that reason, I think the better plan would be to allow, if not legislative review of the result, some type of way to say to the people of Minnesota, everyone had a chance to have a, a hand in this decision. Then I think we're much more likely to come up with the flag that people can say, yeah, you know, I get it and I can support it. And so that's my two cents. And thank you again for the bill as a whole, Senator Murphy, and thanks, Mr. Chair. Further discussion? Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And just to follow up, Senator Murphy, on uh, Senator Friends's comments, I certainly would think at a very, very minimum that the legislative body should be making that decision at a very minimum. But I also think we need to figure out how to get the public involved and not just a few people on a task force. This is a major change. Maybe you're hearing a lot about this, but let me just say this. I've heard more about the flag change, people that are getting very upset about this, than I've ever heard about it needed to be changed. And we're really moving in the wrong direction here. We're just taking away the opportunity for people to participate in a democratic system. And I, I, I think we really need to take another look at this and make sure we get this sent down the right path, because uh, this is certainly not going down the right path. Uh, it's, uh, we need to have people's input. This is a democracy, and we need to continue to treat it that way. And, and I'll, I'll just leave it at that, but just uh, certainly keep that in mind. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, members, uh, it is a democracy. I agree with you wholeheartedly, Senator Dames. Um, and I think if we look at the, the language of Senator Kunish's bill, uh, it does require that the commission uh, impaneled here solicit and gather input from the public. So it is not devoid of, it's not a group that would be working in isolation. I just want to be really clear about that because I believe, um, like I hear from you, Senator Dames, that the voices of Minnesotans are critically important in this. I hear uh, what you are saying. Um, I know Senator Kunish is going to be engaged in this discussion as well. She has just like some of you have expressed a strong perspective on this. Um, and we have a little work to go. And I appreciate your patience and your feedback as we move this important piece of legislation forward and through the process. Thank you. Follow up, uh, Mr. Senator Chair. Senator Dames. How many people are going to be on this commission, Senator Murphy? So it is a, a fairly significant commission. And I'm looking for. I believe it begins on page 62 of the bill. There are 13 members. So we have a 13-member commission that's going to make a, that at this point in this bill would make a decision that's going to affect probably 6.6 .6 million people. I think uh, we're just a little out of balance. Thank Senator you, Senator Murphy. Dames. So... Further discussion on that or other, this first? Okay. Senator Drayheim, I guess. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, and, and that's, I just had one other kind of question. I didn't see this in any of the committees that I, I serve on. And it, it's um, on the construction material. Um, I think it's section 16 of article two. Um, Page 34, I think, is where it starts, uh, Senator Murphy. Um, you know, looking this over and, you know, not had, have seen this before, um, is the intent of this um, section um, for just government projects? Mr. Chair and members, um, this is a proposal that I've been working on with the Blue Green Alliance and a number of the building trades has had. Uh, hearings in state gov and transportation and energy. Part of the legislation is carried in Senator Frentz's bill. Part of the legislation and the funding for the, administ the administrative part of it is carried in this bill. Um, so it's had a, 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 a significant uh, process of hearing. Yes, it is for public projects. And the materials that we're talking about are steel, concrete, and asphalt. Those uh, participants are all at the table. Um, and the goal is to create the means by which we can, when we think about sustainability, uh, 
inform ourselves and uh, around the procurement of uh, sustainable materials that will contribute to the reduction of greenhouse gases going forward. It is a multi-year process to get to the conclusion and it is intended uh, about uh, road construction and public building projects, both new ones and those that are being significantly overhauled. Senator Drahan. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I, I haven't really played in the, the asphalt or the concrete uh, area too much other than carried uh, a bill that would have uh, suggested to the state to use soybean oil for a road sealant instead of a petroleum-based petroleum road sealant, but I haven't got that through yet. Um, but on the building materials, obviously, I play a lot in that area, and, and I know that we already have uh, about a dozen different kind of ratings um, that you can use for building material. So are we trying to recreate the wheel here with, with that section of it? Mr. Chair and members, uh, this is also a new area to me. You may know more than I about steel, asphalt, and cement. Uh, but those industries uh, are coming to the table along with the Blue Green Alliance uh, and a number of our building trades uh, in support of this idea. Um, and so I don't believe that we're creating something new or redundant. I think redundant would be the thing I'm concerned about, but something that will help uh, uh, identify uh, the means to uh, engage in construction uh, that takes us toward that goal of reduction of greenhouse gases. Thank you. Further discussion? Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Chair, I have the 836 amendment. What's the number, A36? Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Senator Murphy, what this would do is, is increase funding to the Council of Asian Pacific Minnesotans to hire a uh, special projects coordinator. When, uh, when this um, council was first uh, formed, I think they, they probably served maybe 50, 50 70,000 people. We're up to 367,000 Minnesotans that are being represented. And yet, in your bill, they are the lowest funded cultural agency, ethnic agency that we have. Um, and they do have uh, a real need because some of this money will be used to, uh, to celebrate the, the 50th anniversary of the end of the Vietnam War, which as we've talked about many times in this chamber, uh, is an extremely important uh, milestone for many of our, of our uh, Minnesotans that have, have uh, immigrated here over the last 50 years. So uh, it's just a real simple amendment uh, to add a project coordinator and make sure that we recognize uh, an important milestone. Mr. Chairman. Senator Pappas. Yeah, Mr. Chairman and uh, Senator Pratt and Senator Murray, I did notice that they were the one council that didn't receive an increase. So be would like to know why not. Mr. Chair and members, um, what you have in the bill in terms of the budget um, is a reflection of what the council's requested. Um, so we carried forward um, in all cases what the council's requested. Um, this amendment as it's drafted would uh, violate our target. Um, so for that reason alone, I would ask uh, for a no vote so we can keep the bill in balance. Uh, but I appreciate your argument, uh, Senator Pratt, and I think we can, we can probably talk about this when we get to conference. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, Senator Murphy, we're, we're not necessarily bound by the target here. We can make changes if we want. And um, having been a, a representative, a Senate representative on this council for a long time, I can tell you that um, they are a, they cover a broad 
uh, and, and diverse uh, group. And Senator Pappas and I have worked uh, and been at, at many of these, you know, met with many of these um, uh, local groups uh, over the years. And the fact that this one agency, I don't know that this was what they requested as, as much as what they were granted. Um, but it seems to me that we are effectively telling a group of people that they are less worthy of our investment than others, especially as we are moving to create a brand new council. Um, so members, I, I would encourage a yes vote. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Pratt, um, I, um, we had testimony from all of the councils uh, at the start of the session. We received all of their budget requests. We honored them. Um, and so this isn't a matter of what they were granted. It is what they requested. It, and, and I, I uh, will just say that uh, the work that we've done in the committee uh, is a reflection of our support and our honor uh, for all of the councils. Um, and we honored them by meeting their request. Um, so I, I hear your point. Um, but it is not, I think, a fair representation to say uh, that they are, in some form or fashion, um, not being honored. Or the request is not being honored. We did. Uh, and so I'm happy to continue this discussion with you. Um, they're important, uh, as every council is important. Um, but at this point, uh, again, because it does um, mess with our, the balance of the budget, I'd ask for a no vote. And we will talk together. Senator Friends. Just briefly, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Pratt. Thanks, Senator Murphy. Senator Pratt, is there some suggestion that since this council testified in Senator Murphy's committee that they've changed their position on their requested appropriation? And if so, um, you know, can you share that with us? I guess all of us put together these budgets, and I'm understanding that they came to the committee, made this request, and it was honored by the chair. So that's my long-winded way of saying, has something changed since then? If so, can you share it with the Finance Committee? Thank you. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and Senator Frentz. I don't know what the original re request was, um, but I do know that when I look at the numbers and I see that um, this is the one council that's underfunded as compared to the others, and uh, as I've talked to the executive director, uh, the need for a special projects coordinator and a need to celebrate the, the, the 50th anniversary of the end of the Vietnam War are certainly issues that maybe weren't considered on an ongoing basis as much as they were um, special basis. And maybe there was a misunderstanding in, in what that was. But yes, the executive director has talked to me and suggested that she needs, uh, she needs these funds in order to uh, meet her mission. And Mr. Chair and Senator, Senator Pratt, I appreciate that. And uh, as I said, the, the council testified um, they worked with the administration, I, I'm certain, uh, and testified uh, with this budget request. Um, I would be so happy to talk with the executive director. I know Ms. Herr. Um, it would be a useful conversation um, to have um, between she and I. Um, but this is what they testified to and asked for, and we honored that request. That's important. Doesn't mean we can't do more. Doesn't mean we shouldn't do more. But I want to be really clear in the 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 process that was used, and the fact that we honored their request. Senator Champion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and thank you uh, to Senator Pratt for at least highlighting this issue, because I do feel strongly about this issue. Um, I'm looking at the section. I'm looking at the differences in uh, resources. I see one council in particular that is uh, that always reads receives at least double what, what the other councils receive. I think the work that the councils do is very important. I do think there needs to be a robust discussion as to what they request uh, in light of the context of maybe they're told that here are the limitations that you, you should do this work. Um, I will not support the amendment today, but I hope that it, it, it uh, really uh, forces us to have a much deeper conversation about equity and and, and what's needed because I do think that the councils are under-resourced. 
uh, and therefore there are lots of things they cannot do to be more of a help to the legislature and to the communities that they represent. Some of the councils have a cross section of people that they have to deal with. Uh, when you think in terms of just the Asian council, I mean, there's Hmong, there's Vietnamese, there are all, all sorts of others, and how do we make sure that they have the resources that they need in real time? And, and that can be said of the others. So I hope that the author, who is always a thoughtful one, you know, uh, of this, of the state uh, government bill, really seriously think about this, because even as I look at this, the, um, uh, the section, it just jumps out where certain questions should be asked. Uh, and I'm, maybe those questions were asked and I wasn't a part of that conversation. I just know that as a person who's sitting on the sidelines and who's constantly talked about the ethnic councils and, the, and, and they're being under-resourced, uh, I'm pretty disappointed that, that we, we haven't done more. So thank you. But I will not be supporting the amendment because I recognize that it's an important one but I think it, it needs to have a, uh, that this issue should be much more robust and comprehensive and not, you know, picking one versus the other. So thank you. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, members, we can say we're going to work on it, but the fact of the matter is this is an omnibus bill that's going to be locked up uh, once we get to the floor. And this is the only opportunity we have to make these types of changes. And so, Mr. Chair, I would request a roll call vote. Okay. And, and Senator Pratt is one who served on the Council of Asian Pacific Minnesotans for a number of years as well. Um, I certainly understand that. I, I also understand that they requested one thing and so on. And just because of the targets that we've been, we have here, I, I ask the members to reject it. There has been a roll call requested. Um, the staff will take the roll. Senator um, Just one additional comment. Um, I, as Senator Pratt said, I've been a strong supporter of the council, so um, I do feel today I'll be voting no, but I, I trust that Senator Murphy will take a serious look at this during conference committee. Mr. Chair uh, and Senator Pratt, uh, I, uh, I will only say that this is not the only place that we can make this change. Um, and I have watched you in, in other moments at such as this uh, suggest when the author says she'll work with you uh, that you have agreed uh, to withdraw your amendment. And I think you, you might consider that here as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sir, uh, staff will take the roll. Chair Marty? No. Senator Friends? No. Senator Pratt? Yes. Senator Champion? No. Senator Dames? Yes. Senator Dreheim? Yes. Senator Eichhorn? Yes. Senator Mohammed? No. Senator Murphy? No. Senator Pappas? No. Senator Westrom? Senator Wickland? No. Senator Westrom? There being four yes and seven no, the motion does not prevail. Further discussion? If not, the plan, as I mentioned earlier, would be to lay this bill over until we take up the elections bill and um, would fold that into this bill at that point. Um, and so Senator Murphy moves that Senate file 1426 as amended be laid on the table. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Um, and we and with that we will I guess the elections bill is ready to go if I don't know if Senator Carlson is nearby um, if he is not we will take a brief recess we will take a brief 
Oh, he's coming. We will not take a brief recess. And I think I said the wrong question and other things. You can receive in the legacy bill. Could you boldly go into this issue? I mean, these are tough questions, right? Yeah. I, I thought you had a great point about the information that we give them before they decide how much they want to ask for. Right. Um, so I give you that one. It's touchy. Yeah. You can probably wait in there easier than I can, although I would say this but is I'm obviously the most important one here. I don't agree with that. They do some, uh, they do some work some on finance. So, um, this one that there's some specific requirements because of the tribal nation status, but I don't know. I used to know more about them. They're going to go back to the elections. Anyway. Yeah, Carlson's here. They're also. Anyway, I need, yeah, I mean, This committee will be in recess till the call of the chair about five minutes.
This meeting of the Senate Finance Committee will come back to order. Senator Carlson, we're going to take up Senate File 1636, the Omnibus Elections Appropriation Bill. Welcome to the Finance Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair and members, I'm offering Senate File 1636, the Senate Elections Committee Finance Omnibus Bill. I'm deeply proud of this historic investment in our election system. The funding in this bill will protect and expand the freedom to vote and make candidates more accountable to voters. It will shine a light on money in politics and influence at the Capitol and at other levels of government. Improving the system for all, uh, all voters regardless of their race, income or zip code. The bill allows voters to vote how and when it's convenient for them, including early voting on Sunday before the election and vote by mail. It makes investments in desperately needed accessibility improvements to polling places across the state for individuals with disabilities. It establishes a task force to explore ranked choice voting and increases public financing that will allow more people to run for office with less reliance on big money donors and more time talking to their constituents. Members, I'm particularly proud of the new protections for election officials in this bill. It will defend our friends, family, and neighbors from harassment as they conduct their duties on election night. During the Elections Committee hearing on this bill, Secretary Simon testified to a specific incidence of election workers being followed in their car, harassed over the phone, and even physically accosted at a polling place. A study by the Brennan Center recently found that one in six election officials nationwide have been threatened, and that one in five are unlikely to serve again in 2024. Election worker recruitment and retention is down across the state, and making a commitment to protect officials from hostility and harassment will restore confidence that workers can safely conduct their duties. This bill will ensure that every Minnesotan feels safe and welcome as they engage in the essential work of the, our democracy. Another critically important provision in the bill is grants for improved accessibilities in accessibility in polling places. These grants can be flexibly used to meet the individual needs of different communities and provide safer and more accessible ramps, railings, restrooms, parking places, and any number of critical improvements to make sure that everyone has the support they need on election day. 
Every Minnesotan should have the freedom to cast their votes privately, independently, and without obstruction. With this bill, we have an opportunity to step up and break down barriers which thousands of Minnesotans with disabilities face every year in our polling places. The RCV, or Ranked Choice Voting Task Force, established by this bill, lays the groundwork for the legislature to make an informed decision about the expanded use of Ranked Choice Voting. Cities across the state are interested in this transformational voting system, and the legislature has the duty to explore every option and provide voters everywhere with the choices they perceive and deserve. The recommendations provided to the legislature by this fair-minded voter-facing task force will accomplish that goal. Furthermore, a clear and consistent system of early voting will allow working Minnesotans and voters across the state to cast their ballot at the time and place which works best for them. Minnesotans deserve every opportunity possible to vote. And the fair standards set by this bill will increase access to the ballot and avoid confusion during election season. I'm deeply proud of the long overdue increase in public financing for candidates. Uh, these candidates will agree to spending limits which will ensure that Minnesotans of all backgrounds can afford to run for office. Single mothers, seniors, individuals with disabilities, and small business people all deserve the opportunity to run for office, and strengthening our system of public financing will allow everyone to have their voice heard in our elections. This investment will also reduce the influence of wealthy donors in our campaigns. Increasing the public financing will allow candidates to spend more time with their constituents and less time courting wealthy voters, amplifying the voices of candidates and local voters on the issues which matter most to Minnesota. Finally, I would like to mention the numerous modernizing changes suggested by the Office of the Secretary of State and the Campaign Finance Board. Matching funds to release millions of Help America Vote, HABA, dollars are contained in this bill as are important changes to our lobbyist and principal reporting systems, which will increase transparency around spending in our elections. By passing these important updates, Minnesota will remain a national leader in elections for years to come. Thank you, and I'd like to offer the A38 amendment that includes various technical changes, removes ranked choice voting education grants, and modifies the public subsidy. And I'm welcoming uh, our Council Lexi Stangle from Senate Council to provide a bullet point over overview of the amendment and its changes. So, Senator Carlson, uh, we have the A38 amendment. There's a 37 in the packet, but this is replacing that. Correct. Okay, Mr. And Chair, Senator correct. 38 replaces. Senator Friends will move the A38 and um, as it's being distributed or when it's distributed, um, Mr. Erickson, you're going to explain it, okay? Wait just a second until people all have it. Okay, I'm, I'm going to, Mr. Chair, I'm going to modify my last statement. Uh, <laughs> Andrew, Mr. Uh, uh, okay. Erickson is going to first go through the the uh, financials, financial pages on the. Uh, and the amendment has been posted online now as well for public and other members. Um, <laughs> go ahead, Mr. Erickson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Carlson. Uh, members, the A38, the first couple of lines here are going to be conforming changes to pull out the, gr the um, grant program at the Secretary of State's office. So page uh, line 1.2 reduces the Secretary of State's change. The 1.3 and 1.4 are deleting the rider language. Uh, line 1.5 is correcting a technical change. And line 1.6 is taking the increased amount that is now available and falling to the bottom line and putting it into the general account of the public subsidy program. Uh, from there, I believe Ms. Stengel will pick up the rest of this amendment. Ms. Stengel, welcome. Go uh, ahead. Th thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Lexi Stengel from Senate Council. Uh, the remainder of the amendment largely um, fixes words that were dropped, fixes grammatical adjust makes grammatical corrections, um, corrects timelines so that they're no longer conflicting, uh, adds draft effective dates and those sorts of things. So I won't go through this um, line by line, but I will in, uh, sort of check off some of the things that are a little bit more substantive than that. On lines 16 and 17, there are some additional words related uh, 
to tampering with data in the SVRS, so it now prohibits uh, changing data in the SVRS and specifies that it happens in the SVRS. Um, there is an update to the effective date on 19 and 20 related to the election judge intimidation provisions that specifies that it occurs to violations on or after the effective date. On 121, there's a new section that is inserted um, that largely makes technical and conforming changes. It deletes a phrase, um, resides and replaces with maintains residence, which is consistent with uh, other changes in this bill and the policy bill. And it adds an effective date um, and then makes another uh, minor change. And this is consistent with some of the provisions that were passed in the bill uh, that was already enacted related to felons having their rights, uh, people that have been convicted of felonies having their rights to restored to vote after they are released from incarceration. Uh, at the bottom of page two on line 31, it deletes section 49, which is the ranked choice voting grant, uh, which both Senator Carlson and Mr. Erickson have spoken about. I'm happy to answer questions on any of the other lines, but I think those are the the substantive pieces. Discussion from members of the committee. Senator Champion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just so that I'm clear to any of the uh, testifiers, so it's my understanding that the writer language that's in the bill referring to grants, uh, so the appropriation for that has been taken out uh, and has re been reappropriated or moved to campaign finance. Is that right? Mr. Sure. Mr. Chair and Senator Champion, that's correct. That money is now in the public subsidy program in the general account. And then my second question, Mr. Chair, uh, do you still have money in this bill for that task force for that uh, that the Secretary of State was doing? And if not, I'd like to know that because, of course, I'm going to make a motion to remove those, uh, to remove at least one of those things. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Champion, the task force is still in the bill. Uh, and there, so there is funding for the legislature and f a little bit for the Secretary of State that remains in the bill. Thank you for that clarification. On the A38 amendment, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. Um, Mr. Erickson, are you going to proceed with walkthrough now or? Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, so members, you again have two spreadsheets in your packets that resemble very strongly the state government, ones with different agencies. Uh, so I won't spend as much time orient orienting you to the detailed spreadsheet, just that if you flip it over and look at the bottom on line 84, you will see that the committee has met its target uh, with 970,000 spent in the current biennium and 9,030,000 spent in the uh, budget biennium for a total of $10 million. And then in the bottom right, $7 million in the tails. So if you move to the change item spreadsheet, you will see, uh, and just for clarity, this spreadsheet hasn't been updated to reflect the A38. This is uh, just the first engrossment. So some of these will have been changed by the A38, as, I, as uh, Ms. Stangle and I just described. But there is on line six, $489,000 one time to the LCC for the Ranked Choice Voting and Voter Engagement Advisory Task Force. There is $1.1 million in the bill to hire some FTEs in the Elections Division at the Secretary of State's office. Uh, on line 11, this is a change from the governor's change item where he had made some recommendations about providing a Hava state match. Since that's been, a, uh, uh, since that recommendation, there has been an, a, an additional um, a pro federal appropriation for the Hava program. And so the bill now appropriates $461,000 one time in the current biennium so that both tranches of the Hava funds have been appropriated and are available. Uh, in on line 12, there's $495,000 one time to pay the redistricting litigation fees um, that have, have occurred in the last two years related to the uh, redrawing of maps for legislative and congressional seats. On line 13, there's $39,000 one time for elections administration changes related to Senator Westland, Senate file 1191. And excuse me, I, I forgot to mention that the redistricting litigation fees had been carried by Senator Coleman in Senate file 1570. On line 14, there is $164,000 with a smaller amount ongoing uh, for provisions related to early voting that were in Senator Westland, Senate file 1434. On line 15, there is $22,000 one time for 
the, uh, the Secretary of State's cost for the Ranked Choice Voting and Voter Engagement Advisory Task Force from Senator Morris and Senate File 2270. Line 16 is the grant money that has been reallocated in the A38. Line 17 is $200,000 one time for an education campaign relating to the restoration of voting rights. Uh, there is a base reduction on line 18 of $48,000 each year. This is related to a transfer that the Secretary of State's office makes annually to the Department of Corrections for a report that is, um, that is produced over there. The bill uh, modifies the, that report, so there are some one-time costs incurred at the Department of Corrections, and the entire base is being moved over to Corrections, so there's no longer a need to make that transfer. There's $800,000 one time for accessibility grants that comes from Senator Hoffman, Senate File 2144. The first two items under the Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board on lines 23 and 24 are governor's proposals to maintain current service levels at a rate of $338,000 in the first biennium and $100,000 uh, for the Campaign Finance Board to use Minutes Cloud Azure Cloud Solutions um, for some of the IT work that is done in that office. There's $440,000 ongoing for two new FTEs for new audit staff. Uh, there is a new number here that says 3.689 million, but this is the number that is changing um, based on the money that fell to the bottom line from the ranked choice voting changes, and that money is being put into the public subsidy. That was Senator Murphy, Senate File 2845. And there is $262,000 for provisions related to lobbyist registrations at, for um, all political subdivisions. That's related to some rulemaking costs and an FTE. On line 31, you will see the report modifications changes at the Department of Corrections. The 33,000 is the ongoing amount, and the 165,000 in the first year is related to the um, changes that need to be made to the way the report is produced. On line 40, you will see a revenue change. This comes from uh, an other bill. This is Senator Bolden's Senate File 3 that the committee heard a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and this is related to a revenue that comes from uh, a report that is uh, provided for a fee on request. Uh, if you move down to lines 50 and 51, these are the other bills for which the committee has to show the costs um, that, it, that it's taking in its target, and those include Senator Champion's House File 28, which was felon voting re restoration, and uh, Senate File 3, Senator Bolden's um, uh, bill that I described above. There is also a small non-general fund uh, portion in Senate File 3 that the committee is also showing but does not affect the target, and this is related to the Department of Public Safety's uh, expenses in the driver's services operating account. And that, Mr. Chair, covers the spreadsheets. Let me quickly point you to the bill language and call out the writers of, uh, of, of interest. On page two, lines 14 to 26, this is the rider uh, for the accessibility grants. The rider on 2.27 to 2.32 is the educational campaign related to the restoration of the right to vote. Uh, the rider on 2.33 to 3.4 is been, has been removed in the A38, and there are some uncodified sections that come after all of the rider sections. You'll see in section six, this is the fiscal 23 appropriation uh, for both tranches of HAVA funds. On section seven, there is the fiscal 23 appropriation for the attorney fees related to redistricting. Uh, section eight is the one-time transfer into the general account for the public subsidy. There is a second component to that that I'll get to in just a second. Uh, section nine takes the money that is actually in the HAVA account and makes it a statutory appropriation. So that is a, a change from current practice where it's directly appropriated out of that account. Uh, but you'll see in the effective date that this will apply to any money that is currently in that account. And then finally, section 10 modifies the statute that provides for a uh, transfer into the general account of the public subsidy. You'll note that this is effective on July 1st, 2025. So uh, because the, the numbers are different in each year in the bill, the first amount is done as a one-time transfer, and then the permanent ongoing amount is effectuated by making the uh, effective date delayed until uh, the, the, the second uh, transfer, when the second transfer is supposed to take place. Uh, Mr. Chair, that is all I have by way of walkthrough. Thank you. Um, Ms. Stengel, you have more. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I'll do sort of a high-level thematic overview of Article 2, which is a policy to implement the pieces that Mr. Erickson has just walked through. 
Article 2 includes a variety of provisions related to campaign finance and election laws and includes the following. A, prohibit, a prohibition on intimidating election judges or interfering with elections, amending lobbying requirements so that it covers lobbying before all political subdivisions, not just metro area governmental units, establishes early voting for the 18 days before election and amends timelines to conform to that 18-day period. Early voting is essentially what it sounds like, showing up and casting a ballot and putting it directly into a ballot box instead of um, in-person absentee voting, which is what the state has now. It amends requirements for the Department of Corrections and Courts reporting related to individuals who have been convicted of felonies and who have been released from incarceration. And that's a conforming change again to the bill that was passed and enacted earlier this session. Changes the word resides to maintains residence in uh, a couple of places. It allows, amends the presidential primary political party list so each party only gets a list of their own voters. Allows for temporary polling places for voting before election day. Allows the name of people whose absentee ballots are rejected to be public before the close of polls. Allows cities, towns, school districts, and other local units of government to require write-in candidates to request that their votes be counted in the same way that the state and counties do. It removes geographical restrictions on mail voting, so all towns and cities of fewer than 400 registered voters, regardless of where they are in the state, may use mail voting. It amends uh, what is frequently called the polling place apparel law, which um, restricts what you can wear, exhibit, or distribute within a polling place. It requires the Secretary of State to, um, uh, well, before it was amended, it provided grants to ranked choice voting uh, cities, but that has been removed. And it establishes a ranked choice voting and voter engagement advisory task force uh, to do a couple of things, to study the implementation of ranked choice voting statewide and locally, to assess voter engagement issues, um, and to look at voter facing issues that sort of cross between ranked choice voting and user um, and accessibility issues. And Mr. Chair, that's all I have. Thank you, Ms. Stengel. Discussion of the bill. Senator Dreheim. Thank you. Um, and thank you for bringing the bill forward today. Um, I, I, ranked choice voting. And just wondering, did you see the report put out by the uh, uh, U of M uh, last month or the last couple weeks, actually, probably? M Mr. Chair, Senator Dreheim. Yes, I have. So I, I, I question the need for Section 49 and 50 with what uh, what the U had had to say in their in their report, um, so I, I guess I'd like to make an oral amendment to delete section forty nine and fifty. Senator, yes, okay. Um, no. Senator Dreheim, section forty nine was deleted earlier. Perfect. So, but you would like to delete the. Ranked Choice Voting and Voter Engagement Advisory Task Force in Section 50. Senator Dreheim offers an oral amendment to do so. Senator Carlson. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I've seen that, but I've also seen some critiques of that, uh, of that report. And so I think we, what we need to do is we need to be sure that that report has accurately reflected the attitude of the voters. And that's what uh, this task force is uh, um, is asked to do, uh, whether this is uh, appropriate to um, to enact ranked choice voting or not, is the rank the uh, task force job, and they may uh, they may say that this is not the right thing to do, and what we need to do is be sure that we look at the people that today are um, forced by their cities or their uh, uh, the people that have. Um, <clears throat> Uh, let's say uh, passed it, and find out if they if they like it, if they think that other people should uh, should be open to it, and also we need to make sure that we answer these communities that have asked for it. There's a lot. There are a lot of communities across the state state that have asked for it, and I think what we need to do is we need to be sure that it is the right thing to do, and uh, that the only <coughs> you know the, the only reason for this is that we need to uh, take our responsibility 
to establish a, uh, a position on that in our uh, elections committee, and I think that this is probably the way to do it, to get a report from this task force, task force to find out just whether or not it is the right thing to do and whether or not we can adapt to it in our communities across the state. Senator Champion. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to Senator Draheim. You know, this, this provision that you're looking at is a very tough provision. Uh, uh, what is true is that there needs to be as much discussion about this as possible uh, from, the, from the perspective of democracy. Not one potential mechanism or another. I know that we removed Section 49 because, you know, and you all moved the money, so I want folks to be clear that there was supposed to be some discussion about how to best collect the information and get a viewpoint as you, you know, are now talking about a uh, great senator. Uh, because one is, you know, when we think in terms of democracy, we're thinking about how do we engage people overall. Number two, those places where, um, there is ranked choice voting. You know, how do we alleviate the barriers that seem to be there for seniors, for English language learners, for communities of color? And I'm just afraid that the task force doesn't necessarily address that because the task force seems to be tasked, for lack of a better word, with a certain um, responsibility. So I do think that you're going to think seriously about this and whether it works or not. I will not, and I entertained, you know, removing Section 50 myself today, but, uh, but out of respect for the architects and those who are working through this, that I do think that we need to have some discussion, um, you know, before it goes forward, because I'm not certain that now, even in a state that addresses what I think you've been so eloquent about, uh, Senator Carlson, I just don't think it will help us around the notion of democracy. So democracy, as you know, I keep saying it, because democracy is important to me. And so I just think that we, I, I, I would hope that we um, are thinking about it. So I will not support the, uh, the amendment today, but I do think seriously something needs to be considered and talked about. Uh, not only with uh, the task force, but any other language around, you know, grants to increase democracy and voter turnout. That's important to me. And to get to the issues of, of the barriers that, that people of color and others um, are wrestling with as we deal with any other mechanism around voting. So thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Chair, to speak to this question, but it, but it is not a foregone conclusion that uh, I, I will not, um, well, I don't need to say that. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Champion. Senator Draheim. Thank you, uh, and, and thanks for the discussion uh, on this. And, you know, I just looked a little harder at the, uh, the makeup of the task force that you have assembled. Um, how, how many members are on this task force? <laughs> Senator Carlson. Um, I have not counted them recently, Mr. Chair and Senator Jaiham, but we've, we've had up to 31, and then we've reduced it, and I think the last number was, uh, if I recall, I think it was 26. Um, and and I, I need to also include in my answer here the uh, uh, a response to Senator Champion. With Senator Champion's help, uh, a lot of things have become obvious to me that uh, we need to not presume that ranked choice voting is the objective of the task force. It is to find out what the, alt the alternatives are and what is workable. Uh, and including, uh, we, we did talk about people that are uh, new voters from other countries or uh, you know, new, uh, new citizens, and uh, they may have a different way of voting than what we've been used to because they may vote for just one person and leave, and leave the polls. And that's, that's something that uh, they've not been used to. They've not been used to having a second choice. And they've not been used to, uh, to things like, uh, I mean, even to the point where we've had 
to explain in the polls today that you cannot cross over from one party to another. That's, that's been probably one of the biggest uh, discussions that I've had with election officials is that people do not understand that you just cannot cross from one to the other or turn over the page and vote for the other party in the primary. So, you know, there's a lot of education that has to happen here of many sorts. And I think, uh, again, if uh, we have two cities that have ranked choice voting that they, they use right now, and from what I understand, there are slight differences in the way they apply it. And that's going to be something that this task force is going, going to have to address, is that if this is going to go any further in any, any other uh, um, <coughs> local options, that we have, to, we have to have a consistent method for the, uh, the votes to be counted and for the uh, people to be able to vote. And it has to be something that is the, the Secretary of State is comfortable with and can uh, can describe it, let's just say, describe it on his website. So it shouldn't be something that has multiple ways to do it in different, uh, in different municipalities. So, and with that, I, I'd have to say that uh, Senator Drahan, Drahan, with the all respect, we need to do this. I think this is our responsibility to clear this up, and I think this is the way to do it. Senator Drahan, on your motion. Thank you, um, Chair Marty and, and Senator Carlson for for the discussion on this, um, you know, Senator Pappas and myself counted the number of members, and it's we think 40 is the number that is in the bill, 4-0. Um, and, and looking over the different uh, appointees or uh, representatives that I, I look at here, I, I would say the majority of them are from the seven county metro area, more than likely. Um, so I, I don't think it's a very balanced uh, membership in, in this working group. And I just, I think it just uh, isn't needed. And I, I just urge everybody to vote, uh, vote yes on my oral amendment. Mr. Mr. Chair. Senator Carlson. Mr. Chair and, and Senator Draham, there's 32 members. And uh, they are split between the two subcategories. Uh, what we need to do is make sure that we have the technical um, instructions correct and that's what the the uh, members that are uh, voter administrators are to do and then we have the the uh, voter facing members those are the ones that will look at how do we communicate with voters and you know what what kinds of education we need need to do they are really two separate uh, activities and they're going to be under the uh, uh, the direction of the Secretary of State because the Secretary of State is the one that has to make the final decision on what's a recommended system. On the Dreheim oral amendment to strike section 50, is there further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Motion does not prevail. Further discussion? If not, Senator Friends moves up oh, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was wondering if I could uh, ask Ms. Stengel a question on line 12.20. I notice it's a small change, but I'm trying to figure out. It says, uh, I sort of, so when, when somebody goes in to vote, they say they have resided in Minnesota for 20 days immediately preceding the election. That's been changed to maintain residence, and I'm trying to figure out what, what the impact of that is. Ms. Stengel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. The idea of maintaining residence versus resided um, is that sometimes people don't live where their residence is. For example, all legislators that live you know, they maintain their residence in their home district while they are living and working here. Another example is like college kids. Um, sometimes they intend to maintain residence at their parents' home instead of their school. And uh, there's, a, there's a statute, it's 200.031, which is the determination of residence. And there's a whole laundry list of factors on how do you decide where somebody is residing. And that looks at things like where do they sleep at night? Where does their family live? Um, 
what is their intention? You know, do they intend to have their residence at that house or at some other location? So there's all of these factors in deciding where somebody resides or maintains their residence. Um, and this particular change came out of the Secretary of State's um, bill suggesting that this would be more consistent with the determination of residence statute than the term resided. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Ms. Stengel, when I think about you know, some of the legislators here, they're really not quote unquote residing here, right? Um, they may have a place to stay uh, temporarily, uh, but it's not their, it's not their, their residence. They have resided. In fact, I, I would dare say that every one of the legislators lives in their primary residence 181 days or more. Um, and just because I sleep one night outside my district doesn't mean I've resided in another district. I'm just concerned that we've had long established rules around residency. Uh, there have been a lot of court challenges along the way around residency that uh, have given us a, a framework for how that's determined, I'm afraid that by a maintained residence basically allows someone to, to vote or to run for office in a, in a district that they can sign a lease in and, and really never live there. Their, their quote unquote primary residence is, is truly somewhere else. And I, Senator Carlson, I have a, I have a strong concern over this over this change it it kind of struck me as as fairly uh, inane but yet even even with the explanation I'm I'm extremely concerned that it has far-reaching implications especially given where we've established residency requirements and court cases along along over over many years Ms. Stengel um, thank you Mr. Chair and Senator Pratt um, I want to be clear that, um, yes, you're correct, I'm not suggesting that this is changing um, how the current law works or that legislators are or are not affected by this change. Um, the determination of resident statute, as I mentioned, is 200.031, and that's the sort of things that you had mentioned, how you decide you know, where your home is and where you reside. That statute itself is not being changed, so all of those rules remain in place. The change is just reside versus maintains residency. Senator Pratt, in other words, um, if I've maintained residence at the same address for 40 years, but I happen to be residing out of Minnesota or for a weekend before the election, um, my, I'm maintaining my residence, that's where I live, that's what that statute picks, but can I certify I've resided at my home address for the last 20 days. If you're out of town, I think that's what this was intended to do. I think it was the Secretary of State that suggested this is a more accurate way of reflecting what the law says, because this is just what the voter has to certify, and how we're having them certify what the law requires. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I, I've got concerns. Let's, you know, I can have somebody who, res, who uh, maintains a residence in St. Paul and retains a, a, a residence in Shakopee, and it effectively gives them the opportunity to choose where they want to vote. Um, where th we've never considered residency, if you go on a business trip and you spend a week outside of the state, I don't think anybody would say that was residing outside the state. That's, that's not what the, the courts have determined residency to be. But this seems to be a huge loophole in our election law that could allow someone to decide where they wanted to vote based on where they think they might have the highest partisan impact. And we have long-tested, long-maintained laws around the current language that I think I'm not I'm, I'm finding this to be more than just a technical change mr. chair and 
and I've got strong concerns and I just wanted to know what was going on and I still have strong concerns. Thank you. Further discussion on the bill? Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Senator Carlson, I, I can't find it in the bill, but I, I probably missed it here. Does this bill include the language to where we start registering voter, voters at age 16? Or can you tell me, is that in a different bill? Senator Carlson. Mr. Chair, Senator Dames, no, this does not include that. Uh, that's included in uh, another bill. That's in the uh, democracy bill. Thank you. Further discussion, if not, Senator Friends moves at the Senate. Oops. Senator Friends doesn't move yet. Senator Friends moves that Senate file 1636 as amended be laid on the table. On that motion, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? No. Motion prevails. That bill is laid on the table, and so we can get back to Senator Murphy's bill. Mr. Um, Chair, I would move that we take Senate File 1426 off the table. Yes, Senator Murphy moves we take Senate File 1426 off the table. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt has an amendment to offer. Senator A43. Pratt has the A43. Thank you, Senator Murphy and Mr. Chair. And I'll let uh, fiscal staff describe the amendment. Yes, Mr. Harris. Yes. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Pratt, I'd be happy to walk through that. So We the, don't have, members oh. don't have it yet, so let's give just a minute to get it out yet. Go ahead, Mr. Erickson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and again, so the, the A43 that is in front of you is shifting some of the money that is in the bill on lines 1.2 and 1.3. There is, uh, in, and actually in tandem with uh, line 1.4, there's some money that is being forward shifted in the ERP systems line item at MMB. $10,000 each year is being shifted uh, forward. That money is already available for all four years. So there's, there's not a dramatic impact there. Uh, on line 1.5 is the uh, part that we saw earlier in the, uh, the amendment Senator Pratt offered uh, before we took up the elections bill that adds the money $250,000 in each biennium to the Council on Asian Pacific Minnesotans. On lines 1.7 to 1.9, this is reducing the amount uh, that is going into the asset preservation at the Minnesota Historical Society, pulling down uh, the $270,000 necessary to make space in the first year. Uh, the TAILS money is the $20,000 in savings from the ERP system shift, as, long, as well as the $230,000 that remained on the bottom line um, when the bill came into committee. So with this, the bill is now hit, would hit both its, its current and its TAILS targets. Discussion then, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Murphy, for uh, your work on this. I, I do appreciate it. I didn't quite get what you were what you were signaling before, but um, I think this is a, a great compromise, and I encourage mo vote members to vote yes. Further discussion on A43 amendment. If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion prevails. Senator Murphy. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, before we move um, this next step, the, the one thing I didn't have a chance to do but would like to do is to make sure and say thank you um, to the people who were a part of uh, state and local government uh, and the Veterans Committee. It has been an adventure for sure. Uh, we've had a lot of robust debate, but really do want to thank uh, Teresa Mosier, Alexis Kesey, Haley Bloom-Peterson, Joey Wiley, um, I'd like to thank uh, our lead, Senator Anderson, um, our vice chair, Nicole Mitchell, Senator Mitchell, and of course, Andrew Erickson and Stephanie James, our fiscal analyst, and uh, our, our legal counsel, and Joan White, who's not with us today, who is the legal counsel for local government. Uh, they have been tremendous. And with that, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, we are ready to combine the bills. 
So Senator Murphy moves to amend Senate File 1426 by adding the contents of Senate File 1636 as amended and instruct the staff to make the technical and conforming changes. Is there a discussion on that motion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion prevails. Senator Murphy, um, on Senate file 1426 as amended, uh, motion to, um, motion that Senate file 1426 be recommended to pass and sent to the floor. That's as my amended. motion, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much for a wonderful morning. Any further discussion on that motion? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. The motion prevails. Thank you, Senators Murphy and Carlson and everybody behind all the scenes and all that work. We're thank gonna, you, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you, Senator Carlson. We're going to move now to the Veterans Bill, Senate File 2247. Senator Mitchell, welcome to the Senate Finance Committee. And um, I know that you and Senator Murphy have been pushing to have this as a separate bill. So it's traveling as a separate bill now. And um, go ahead. You can present the bill, and then we, can, we have an amendment, which we may, um, I believe we have a technical amendment. But why don't you present the bill first? Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, members of the committee, it's nice to be here for the first time. Uh, this is a veterans omnibus bill, and it's um, my focus on putting this together was just to make sure both our current service members and our veterans were well taken care of. Uh, I think it's a, a really wonderful split of projects that are both Democrat and Republican, and it includes things like um, places for veterans to go and have camaraderie and heal. It includes more funding for PTSD treatment. It includes uh, health and fitness, an expansion of the veterans bonus pro program and uh, the criteria to get into that because it wasn't including all residents of Minnesota that would have otherwise been eligible. Um, so it's just, I think, really a commitment to our veterans, and I'm so happy that we were able to work through the process to get this to pass on our own because uh, that was really important to our veterans groups. So that's $128 million new dollars to take care of our veterans, which I believe is unprecedented. Uh, with more on this, if I could please turn <laughs> to Mr. my colleague who's Mr. shuffling Erickson. through his papers. Go through it. And did you want to... Adopt the amendment first? Oh, I believe that Senator Murphy is offering sure. the amendment, which I do consider a friendly amendment. Senator Murphy, the A6 amendment? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and members, I have the A6 amendment. Uh, I have uh, worked uh, with uh, Chair Mitchell, or excuse me, Senator Mitchell, who's the author of the bill, uh, and with uh, MDBA. On uh, this language, uh, there is money in the spreadsheet to support this, um, and we are um, offering, I am offering an amendment to put together uh, a working group uh, that looks at the care, the quality of care, and the kind of care uh, that is being delivered at the veterans' domiciliary residence, both in Minneapolis and in Hastings. And I want to be really clear about this. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in Minneapolis at the, at the vet's home. I've spent a lot of time at Hastings and at the vet's home. Uh, it is clear to me that the people who work there care deeply about veterans' care, and it's clear to me that the veterans are getting great care. But the demands uh, for care uh, in those facilities um, is shifting, um, and uh, we continue to hear um, expressions of concern, mm -hmm. enough so that I think it is right for us to take a look um, at what we're doing to make sure that we are not just meeting the needs of the vets that are there, but we are prepared for the vets who are coming uh, uh, and, and if there are any vets who are living in a domiciliary at this point, I just want to be really, really clear. Uh, I, as the author of this amendment, and I believe as I have worked in this committee, 
Uh, there's uh, all support uh, for the domiciliaries. They are important. I understand uh, both the, the housing and the care delivery that is occurring in those places. Uh, but I think it is right for us to take a look and to make sure that we are prepared for today and for tomorrow. And with that, I would ask for your support for this amendment. Uh, Go ahead, <laughs> Mr. Chair, there is also a technical oral amendment to that that I'm hearing needs to be done. Ms. White. Mr. Chair and Senator, on page 2, line 23, Please delete legislative. Could you repeat that again, Ms. Witt? On the A6 amendment, page 2, line 23, delete legislative. And that's just the one word deletion. Okay. Senator Murphy, did you want to incorporate that into the amendment rather than? That would be right, Mr. Chair. So, Senator Murphy is offering the A6 amendment with the word legislative stricken from line 23 on page 2. Is there further discussion on the A6 amendment? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion prevails. Uh, Mr. Erickson, you ready to go through the bill as amended? Absolutely, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, once again, there are the two spreadsheets before the committee. The detailed one, again, you're very familiar with this at this point, so I won't orient you, but the general fund target appears on, again, the last page in the middle shaded column. The bill spends $128,000,000 or $128,400,000 over base, which was the, the target, and uh, the Tails number is 64,982,000, which is just a shade under the $65 million tails target. Uh, the rest of, of the um, changes there I will discuss on the change item spreadsheet. So moving over to that change item spreadsheet, there is $802,000 to maintain current service levels at the Department of Military Affairs. $3.2 million for enlistment bonuses, though that just came down in the amendment that was adopted uh, as it's shifting over into that new change item on the domiciliary report. Uh, there's $1.1 million for domestic operations communication capabilities, which is a governor's change item. $1.2 million for the creation of a cyber coordination cell, that's three FTEs to coordinate cyber defense and response missions. $10 million one time for a new Minnesota Military and Vets Museum. $17.6 million one time for an Army Combat Fitness Test field house. Moving down into the Department of Veterans Affairs, there is $33.2 million to maintain current service levels, $20.1 million for operational funding at the three new veterans homes that are coming online this year, $2.9 million for uh, homeless veterans and the SOAR program, which was previously funded out of the State Soldiers Assistance uh, uh, line. There is funding increased for the state veteran cemeteries, uh, a larger amount this year because there's a new cemetery coming online in Redwood Falls. That's $3.6 million in funding. There's $8.7 million for MACV, supportive housing grant increase. The larger amount in the first year is to purchase some permanent units uh, while there's ongoing money for property management and resident support. There's $3 million here. This is a, actually a cost neutral provision. You'll see that $3 million is being canceled in the current biennium and being reappropriated in fiscal 24. There has been some significant underspending in that line item uh, relating to homelessness. And so this is an effective uh, extension of funds, but it's being done in this way to make sure it's a cost neutral uh, initiative under the budget rules. There's a $250,000 one time increase in the, the direct veteran assistance grant to MACV. One and a half million dollars for a veterans community health program, which is uh, an increase in of four, and then eight FTEs that are embedded in um, non-veterans, uh, non-VA uh, health settings that are ge geographically diverse. One and a half million dollars for uh, increase to core. This is added to to what's already in the base for this program. Uh, there is five point, or fi sorry, five hundred and sixty thousand dollars for an inc operational increase uh, for the LinkVet call line, 
$15 million one time for the post 9-11 veterans services, service bonuses, $650,000 for the recently separated veterans program, so it is to connect recently discharged veterans with services that are available to them, including managing uh, the database and online system that, that they use for this purpose. $250,000 one time is for a commemoration program for the 50th anniversary of the Vietnam War. $1.1 million is ongoing for the Metro Meals on Wheels program from Senator Mitchell, Senate File 774. $150,000 is ongoing funding for Camp List Veterans Retreat funding. That was Senator Utke, Senate File 1237. There is $2 million one time for, uh, the, for grants to, via, to veteran service organizations to uh, bring their buildings into compliance with the ADA. This was money that was in Senator Lang, Senate File 2118. There is $100,000 in one-time funding for a grant to veterans on the lake. That is a Senator House Child, Senate File 351 provision. There is $200,000 in ongoing money for the Veterans Resilience Project, as well as some uh, language changes to the riders there that, that Ms. White will cover. Uh, this was carried in Senator Mitchell, Senate File 1509. This is also the first bill that we've seen today that has a change in an open appropriation. The GI Bill eligibility is being expanded by this bill um, to increase the amounts for which uh, eligible members can receive. And the expected uh, effect on the general fund is about $1.5 million each year. That's currently under the statutory cap for that appropriation, but the committee still needs to capture the effect of the eligibility expansion. Uh, so with all of that, Mr. Chair, that covers the change items that are in the bill. Turning to the bill language, I'll just call out a couple of the riders. Um, the enlistment incentives on page 2, lines 27 to 3.2, that's typical rider language that allows the enlistment incentive money to be used in either year and any unspent amount to be carried forward. There is... Uh, on line, or sorry, on page four, there is the grants. This is the, the writer language for Senator Lang's ADA compliance grants. Paragraph K on page five has some extended avail availability for that grant money. There's also extended availability of some of the grant money for the veteran, uh, homeless veterans and SOAR program money on page six. On page eight, the writer for paragraph S, you'll see that it looks lopsided, that it's 4.3 million in the first year, 1.3 in the second. This is half of that cancel and reappropriate change uh, to make that cost neutral. The other half of that is on page nine in the uncodified section four for fiscal 23. That is all I have, Mr. Chair, and I think Ms. White will pick up article two changes. Thank you, Mr. Erickson. Ms. White, welcome back. Mr. Chair and members, Joan White from Senate Council. I'll be going over Article 2, the Veterans Affairs, Affairs Statutory Changes. Um, Article 2 starts on page 10. Section 1 expands the definition of the term resident veteran for purposes of the Veterans Bonus Program. Section 2 adds inherent resolve campaign medal to the list of medals for which a veteran may receive a bonus. Uh, sections 4, 5, and 6 amend the Minnesota GI Bill program. Um, the section increases the amount of post-secondary educational assistance from $3,000 to $5,000 per year and increases the lifetime cap from $10,000 to $15,000 per year. And the last section uh, makes veterans' spouses and current military service member spouses eligible for the therapy through the Veterans Resilience Project. And this section's uh, effective the day following final enactment. That concludes Article 2. Questions from the committee? Senator Eichhorn. I believe so. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Mitchell. First of all, thank you for, for working to run this as a standalone bill. All the veterans in, in my communities asked for that, so we're very happy to see it. So thank you for your work on that. I do have one small amendment. Uh, hopefully it'll be a friendly amendment. It's the A5, and I can talk about it while they're handing it out if you want, Mr. Chair. Okay, it will be distributed if you, if it's easy to explain while yep. it's being distributed. It's pretty easy ahead. to explain. So this relates to the 9-11 bonuses. Uh, Senator Mitchell, uh, the original request was 22 million. We have 15 million in here. 
Um, I know the house did the full 22 million, so this would just simply uh, put some, take some additional money from the general fund, doesn't take anything from anywhere in your bill, uh, increases it by that 7 million and puts the 9-11 bonuses at the 22 million to match what the request was and what the house did. That's simply what the amendment does, Mr. Chair. And um, so I would love to do this, but it doesn't fall within the target. So I'm going to ask members not to accept it. Uh, um, discussion Ms. on the amendment. Mr. Chair, may I? Go ahead, Senator Mitchell. Um, so my, my comment to this would be, uh, this is a veteran's bonuses. Uh, there is still some money left. And we did the 15 million because obviously we were trying to fund other things like the um, uh, programs for veterans to have PTSD and, and things of that nature. This is something where if the money runs out down the road, and as I said, this, this, there's already still remaining money in this account, that we could fund it again in the future um, because they aren't able to predict how many people will actually take advantage of this. Um, and, and because there's no funding anywhere else, it, it would in fact blow the target. So I appreciate the sentiment. It's something we really looked hard at, but that's where we ended up. Further discussion on the A5 amendment. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, members, I would encourage you to vote for the uh, A5 amendment. I think Senator Eichhorn explained it very well. And this is something in many cases we've done, I think, in every war, after every war uh, since the Civil War. Um, I just, with, a, with an $18 billion surplus, I, I'm surprised we can't find $7 million uh, to fully fund this program. So, Mr. Chair, I encourage a yes vote. Senator. Senator. Senator Dreheim. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I, I guess I, I would agree that, you know, the sacrifices these families make, um, you know, we, we should be able to, the finance chair hopefully can find um, $7 million somewhere with, uh, you know, the proposed new taxes and uh, the huge surplus we have. Um, I, I think this is a important. Um, I, I guess I'd like to request a roll call vote on on this amendment. I, I think it's a pretty important one. Thank you. Senator Mitchell, I, just to clarify what you were saying earlier, the money in the account right now, this is to add to that so more people can get it. Yes, there was Explain again, Mr. Erickson. Uh, 20, there was 22 million appropriated last year. So, yes, there was 22 million already appropriated last year. Um, uh, the, you know, we had the, the higher request, but I have talked to the governor's office and they're okay with the 15 million for now, um, knowing that if, and we haven't run out of that. So this will be another infusion. Um, so many of the veterans have already been captured. We changed a residency requirement. So for example, if you had enlisted in another state, but now are living and retired in Minnesota, you wouldn't have been eligible for this. So we're not sure how many people are captured. Um, the governor's office has indicated that they're not super upset that we changed the numbers, knowing that we could fund it again should the money run out. But the original allotment has not even run out. Thank you. Senator Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Senator Mitchell uh, has made this point and I think it's important, right? This is not a new program. This is uh, something that's already in place. Um, as we have listened to the testimony, it is the number of people and reaching the people uh, who would benefit from this is an unclear number. Uh, and there has been a commitment uh, made in the past and going forward that if the funding available is inadequate, that we will continue to fund. So whether it is 15 million or 22 million, we're not sure that the funding that is here is meeting the number because the number is yet uh, is 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 not it is not determined. Um, and so I think that the the fact that the, we have made a commitment to this, there's already funding that has not been exhausted. We're adding new funding um, that may or may not be exhausted. Um, is is 
the operating point here. Uh, we are in uh, this legislature continuing to fund this important benefit uh, for people. And uh, I think that adding money uh, that is outside of the budget target, um, while uh, I understand the House has done that, uh, the Senate bill is uh, tending to some other additional things. And uh, if, you know, along the way, the finance chair or uh, the because uh, you're talking about the House, maybe the Speaker of the House uh, finds funding for this, that's great. But right now, uh, I would urge members to vote uh, with Senator Mitchell and keep the bill intact. No further discussion. The staff will take the roll on the A5 amendment. Chair Marty? No. Chair, uh, Senator Friends? No. Senator Pratt? Yes. Senator Champion? Senator Dames? Yes. Senator Dreheim? Yes. Senator Eichhorn? Yes. Senator Mohammed? No. Senator Murphy? No. Senator Pappas? No. Senator Westrom? Yes. Senator Wickland? No. Senator Champion? There being five yes and six no votes, the motion did not prevail. Further discussion? Mr. Chair. Senator Eichhorn. I don't have any other amendments, but I didn't mention earlier, I just wanted to also uh, thank Senator Mitchell for including the Camp Bliss appropriation. That's something I worked on in the past. Uh, was never in my district, but have seen the good work they do and appreciate the funding for that. Uh, they do a lot of good work with veterans and, and really help them out. So I appreciate the funding for that. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for bringing this uh, bill forward, Senator Mitchell. I, like, uh, just as Senator Eichhorn said, I th this is an important bill for our veterans. And uh, it's typically a non-controversial bill. Uh, and I'm glad we were able to, to move it along separately. Uh, I think our veterans want to see us working together on, in areas that we agree, and, and this is certainly one. And so to the, to the chair and, and, and to you, thank you for bringing this uh, forward as a separate bill. I know it's going to mean a lot to our veterans. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments, Senator Mitchell? Uh, thank you for letting me present this here today. Um, I, I do want to thank Chair Marty, um, Senator Murphy, um, Leader Dietzik, we have actually, just to your point, been working on this for several weeks, making sure this could move by itself because uh, that's the way we felt would be the best to honor all of our veterans. Um, and, and also to Senator Murphy, allowing me as the vice chair of the state and local government and veterans committee, um, and as a veteran myself, to be able to carry such an important bill. So uh, thank you to everyone that worked on this. Um, including the people surrounding me. And I can't wait to get this to the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Murphy moves at Senate file 2246 at, um, as amended. Yeah. As amended be recommended to pass. Is there further discussion? Mr. Chair, I think it's uh, Senate file 2247. Isn't that what I said? No, I'm sorry. Um, uh, if I said that wrong, Senator Murphy moves at Senate File 2247 be recommended to pass, as amended be recommended to pass. On that motion, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Thank, Thank you, you, Ms. White and Mr. Erickson. Um, we are going to take a three minute break for Senator Friends to get papers, and we are going to Begin, we only have time to do beginning of the energy bill, but we're going to take that up now so we have less work to do after we recess for session. So a three-minute recess.
This meeting of the Senate Finance Committee will come back to order. We don't have too long until the um, floor session, but if Senator Friends wants to introduce the bill, and then I counted the lines in the spreadsheet, and I think Mr. Mueller has about six seconds per line, and he could probably get through the whole spreadsheet. But anyhow, go ahead, Senator Friends. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members. Very proud to present to you Senate File 2847, which is our Energy Omnibus Finance Bill. Um, this bill represents four months of work by both Republicans and Democrats on the Energy Finance Committee. I'm here with Mr. Stanley and Mr. Mueller to present it. I understand, Mr. Chair, that we'll have time to get through the spreadsheet, give or take, before we break. Um, first, just a few comments. Um, energy is nonpartisan. Uh, the cost and reliability of energy have been important to Minnesotans since electricity was first introduced to the grid. We're bringing this bill forward to provide reliability enhancements, distribution, transmission, and to provide avenues for all our energy forms to be available. And by that, I mean um, all of the above strategy. It's no secret that I'm uh, committed to reducing carbon emissions in the state of Minnesota, and I'm sorry that that news is as bad as it is. We have a climate crisis on this planet. It's heating up, and while that may not be quite as urgent for someone in their 50s, I got a feeling those that are in their teens and 20s are watching us very closely. The bill makes investments in renewable energy and allows us to continue on our path without sacrificing reliability, without sacrificing affordability, and leaves open some room for innovation. Mr. Chair, you've heard me say this before, but I'm a big believer in American <laughs> innovation and our capacity to do things. And the uh, appropriations in this bill that you'll hear about in a minute allow Minnesotans to say, let's find out what our best, most reliable, and cheapest forms of energy are, and let's head that way. Before I turn it over uh, to Mr. Mueller, Mr. Chair, I do have a technical amendment, the A31, and my thought was if I could put that on to begin with, then perhaps we could go to the spreadsheet. Go ahead. Um, Senator Friends moves the A31 technical amendment. And I might ask Mr. Mueller to describe it briefly. Mr. Mueller? By saying that it's technical. Um, Mr. Chairman and members, the A31 amendment is the author's amendment, and I'll go through it. I'm not going to go through line by line, but I'll describe just broadly what it does. The first part of the amendment, lines 1.2 to 1.5, adds some additional uh, appropriation to the Department of Commerce to, to, uh, due to a late fiscal note. And the increased amount here, it's about 201000 per year, is assessed back, so it doesn't affect the bottom line of the spreadsheet. Lines 1.6 through 1.23, there's a, a number of spots in the bill that we're clarifying that when an appropriation is made and transferred into another account, we're trying to get the, the correct language in the bill to technically do that. So a lot of that language on those lines is that, and also making appropriations available till June 30th, 2027, instead of beyond. Um, on lines 1.24 to 1.25, that's increasing the appropriation to the PUC, again, for a late fiscal note. And that increased amount is also assessed back, so it doesn't affect our bottom line. Um, lines 1.26 through 2.12, again, is other clarifying language that trans when we appropriate money from the general fund and transfer it to another account, we're getting all that language in there that does that. And also some of that language um, clarifies the availability until 2027. Uh, lines 2.13 through 2.17 is just some technical references that are being clarified. Uh, lines 2.18 through uh, 3.12, this amends Chapter 24, which has already been enacted into law, which was the uh, first energy uh, appropriation bill um, the IIJA, the, the federal matching money. After it was enacted, um, MMB requested a clarification of some language in that from that bill, and that you see on lines 2.20 through 2.30, 2.23 just clarifies that the amount that was appropriated is transferred into the new account, the state competitiveness account. So that's amending uh, current uh, session law. Um, so that takes us down to 3.14, and I think Mr. Stanley is going to cover the items after that. Mr. Stanley, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Uh, good morning. The change on 3.14 to 3.16 is just designed to fix some timeline issues from a practical standpoint that the earlier language 
would have required um, this pushes out the date by which the Utilities Commission has to issue an order uh, explaining the new uh, community solar garden program requirements so that it's a little more workable. Lines 3.17 and 3.18 are just technical fixes to a sentence. Lines 3.20 through 21 fix a repealer issue that was in the earlier language where something was being repealed that shouldn't have been repealed. And then the last change, Mr. Chair, at the bottom of page three and carrying you all the way to the end of page five is just the addition of that guardrail language for grants that's been much discussed in this committee. Is there any discussion on the A31 amendment? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. Mr. Mueller, want to go ahead with the spreadsheet. Um, Mr. Chairman and members, I will <clears throat> start by jumping to page four of the spreadsheet and quickly talk about what the target was for this uh, uh, area. The target was $255 million over the forecast for fiscal year 24-25. And part of that is was in chapter 24, the state competitive, competitiveness fund. So of that 255 million, 115 million has already been passed and enacted. So that leaves 140 million, which this bill has. And most of that is one-time money. The target for the tails is 10 million. And this bill actually comes in below target on the tails at 9.678 million. So, so jumping back up to the front, first page, um, I'll be working off the columns, uh, Senate 2023 budget. Um, there's fiscal year 24, 25, and then 26, 27. And if you look on the, the column Senate minus forecast, that'll show the change versus the forecast. Um, we'll start with Public Utilities Commission. The change items start on line 11, uh, maintain current service levels. This was uh, in the governor's budget, 3.3 million. Uh, the modifications for community solar gardens, this was just in the fiscal note that we, we received after this bill passed out of committee and was reflected in the technical amendment. So this adds 215,000 per year for that. Dispute resolution with the utilities adds 465,000 to the PUC. Um, the work that they do with the electrical vehicle rebate program is 128,000 and compensation for PUC proceedings is 64,000. All these amounts are ongoing, and all these new amounts, when they're added to PUC's appropriation, they're all become part of an assessment that goes back to the general fund. So any additional money that we appropriate to the PUC is assessed back, ends up being a net zero as far as uh, new spending goes. So next would Go to the Department of Commerce. There's two divisions of commerce that this uh, bill covers. The energy resources is the first one. And this um, division largely uh, is, has general fund money. And I'll start going through the line items here. Uh, the operating cost increase is about 2.798 uh, million. And this is basically their operating adjustment that was in the governor's uh, proposal. Um, energy and regulation planning up by 643,000. Again, that is part of their operating increase. The solar for schools, this was a, a governor's initiative. The governor had 61.5 million for additional money for solar for schools. Uh, the Senate bill has 15 million, one time. I'll note on line 33 is that state competitiveness fund. The governor had this as part of the, the governor's uh, overall proposal. The governor was at 113.75. So this shows zero here, but that was actually passed in chapter four, 24. Um, Pre-weatherization and workforce training. Uh, this was a governor's initiative at $23.9 million. And this covers households that do not otherwise qualify for federal weatherization um, grants. And it also provides for workforce training. Line 35, strengthen Minnesota homes. This is another item that was in the governor's bill. It's uh, 
1.478 million in 2425 and 1 1.239 million in the tails. It's one of the few programs where there's money in the tails. Um, this was also in the governor's bill and it uh, directs financial assistance to uh, historically disadvantaged Minnesotans who lived in areas of the state that are high risk of climate driven events to make home improvements. And this will also provide for insurance discounts for those that um, participate in this program. The advanced nuclear study on line 36 is for $300,000 and this report is due on January 31st, 2025. Um, Line 37 is a National Sports Center solar array and roof. There's $850,000 from the general fund and that will help pay for the roof repairs and preparation. There's also $4.15 million um, in Article 2 from the Renewable Development Account and that part will pay for the solar um, array on the roof of the National Sports Center in Blaine. The clean energy resource teams on line 38, um, this is a $500,000 a year ongoing appropriation. This is on top of the, they currently receive 500,000 a year through a, an, an assessment. So that assessment remains and this is 500,000 a year that goes on top of that ongoing. The next one is line 39, this is a high voltage transmission line to North Dakota for $17.5 million. Um, this will help provide for some of the matching money that they maybe wouldn't otherwise get through the IIJA uh, bill and to pay for other uh, uh, costs. Tribal Energy Grants, line 40, this is a, another ongoing program of uh, $4.8 million for grants for, the, for clean energy projects by tribal nations or communities. And part of this is for tech, four point or 410,000 per year is for technical assistance and um, admin costs for the, there's a tribal advocacy council also established in the bill and that helps pay for the cost of that and that is another item that is ongoing. The Minnesota Energy Alley on line 41, this is a grant to a clean energy economy Minnesota and it provides for seed funding for businesses and developing training and recruitment. Um, Line 42, $500,000 for the Run River Dam feasibility study. Um, to, this is to study the, for recreational uses that the dam would provide um, and also generating hydroelectric power. Residential electric panel grants on line 43. There's 3.5 million of general fund and also 3.5 million from the renewable development account. And this is for grants to upgrade electrical residential electrical panels, and it targets households with an annual in income of 150 AMI. And the grants are up to $300,000 per household um, based on your income. Distributed energy grants, line 44 is $10 million of general fund, and there's $5 million from the renewable development account. It's a grant to utility to make transmission and storage upgrades um, for capacity. Climate Innovation Financial Authority, line 45. This is what's otherwise known as the Green Banks. And it's $5 million and it provides for grants and loans and other financing um, to help leverage public and private capital for projects. Um, the next lines 46 through 48 all deal with benchmarking provision that's in, that is in the bill. Um, there's $1 million for commerce to establish the program uh, 750,000 for grants to utilities and $750,000 to um, technical associations um, for, with technical schools. The heat bump rebate program on line 49 provides uh, $6 million general fund and there's also $6 million in the renewable development account for grants to households to help offset the cost of new heat pumps. Up to, and these grants of are up to $4,000 each. Electrical vehicle rebates, line 50, there's $2 million from the general fund and $2 million from the renewable development account. Um, for, these are provide for rebates for vehicles that are less than $60,000. And the rebates, I believe, are up to about $2.5 million for individuals, businesses, and nonprofits, and also political subdivisions. 2.5,000, yes. Um, 
the next part of that proposal, line 51 is the electric vehicle. There's all there's a $2 million of general fund and $2 million from the renewable development account for grants to auto dealers to offset the cost of training and equipment to certify the dealers to sell electric vehicles. Line 52, on-site energy storage system. This provides for $2 million for energy storage systems at the site of a solar generating system. Line 53, feasibility study for battery storage using Minnesota iron ore. Um, this is a study for $500,000 and is due on February 1st, 2025. Next we have uh, line 54, electric grid resiliency grants, $15 million of general fund. Uh, these are grants to uh, consumer owned utilities and cooperatives to develop or improve distributive energy resources. Uh, it provides for grants of up to $250,000. Line 55 is electric school bus grants. Uh, again, there's $2 million of general fund and $5 million from the renewable development account and for up to 75% of the cost to purchase or convert school buses to electric school buses. Um, and this is, would be uh, working with other federal and other uh, grant programs are available that this would help fill in the gaps that those uh, programs might have. Line 56 is air ventilation program grants, and these are uh, grants to school districts for upgrading their uh, HVAC systems. And so that is it for the Department of Commerce general fund changes. Uh, Mr. Mueller, I think because of the time okay. and we're going into floor session, I, mean, I think we're going to have to cut it off there and recess. Okay. We can begin the next page when we resume. Um, I will encourage for committee members um, before we head over to the chamber, the pages are going to remove loose paper related to the bills we've already completed. So if there are any documents in those that you want to keep, please stick them in the folder. Otherwise, the stuff we're working on now and the other bill, the next bill, um, they will not touch them. But um, to assist them, if you want to keep anything from the previous bills, please put that in your folder or bring it with you. And for members of the committee and so on, I believe, um, I'm not sure how long floor session will go today, but we're planning to come back. The plan would be 30 minutes after adjournment to the floor session, uh, call of the chair. But um, we're hoping that's not too late because we'd like to get through this bill and Senator Herr's environment bill as well. And with that, this committee is in recess until the call of the chair.